Okay, and we are recording. Okay, we're all set ish. We are all set. Okay, uh, welcome to the March 6th meeting of the City of Boulder's Cannabis Licensing Advisory Board. Um, let's go ahead and start with instructions for virtual meeting and rules of decorum. No problem. I'm going to share my screen. All right. This is the public participation at cannabis licensing and advisory meetings. The city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and board and commission members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. More about this vision and the project's community engagement process can be found on our website. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimonies shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other form of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct a meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to sign up to speak using only the name they are commonly known by, and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. Currently, only audio testimony is provided, permitted online. And so for anyone here who is looking to give public comment, you will need to rename yourself to your, the name that you're commonly known. Next, I'm going to do a member roll call. Kayla, yeah. your, your audio is coming in and out a little bit. Okay. Is this better? Yes, that's good. All right. I'm going to do member roll call here. You'll just speak your presence aloud. Member Christy? Present. Member Green? Here. Chair Kutzman? Present. Member Malone? Present. Member Noble? Present. Ex officio Thompson? Present. Ex officio Bailey? Present. And I don't believe Member Anderson has joined us yet. And I, and do, not have, I do not have a text from him yet either, so. Okay. And then uh, Vice Chair Keegan will join us around between 4 and 4 there. Exactly. Um, so uh, I assume everyone has seen the minutes from January 9th. Uh, was there any comments, corrections, suggestions? How about a motion to approve then? Anyone? Stacy, I know you're just itching to do that since Brian's I'll motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. All right, a second on that. That. All right, and any um, votes against approving those or abstentions? Okay, they're approved. So going on to general public comments for the board, um, as stated and planned, uh, we're going to divide out public comments into two different sections. Uh, this section is the same as every other uh, month selection for general public comments. And uh, then there will be a second uh, or public comment session just with respect to hospitality. So those that would like to speak just generally about issues pertaining to the Cannabis Board um, should choose to do so now, and those that want to sign up to speak against, or excuse me, speak speak in um, about the issue of hospitality, um, should wait for that moment. So, if you're wanting to do, if you're wanting to speak on general public comments, go ahead and raise your hand now.
I'm not seeing any hands raised for general public comment. Okay. So any policy suggestion forms? There were none for this month, no. Okay, so we'll move on to item number four on the agenda, uh, the Boulder Marijuana Hospitality City, or no, that's not, that's not a good title. Did we come up with that title? Um, issues pertaining to um, establishing hospitality establishments in the city of Boulder. Um, so those that want to do public comment on that issue, please raise your user virtual, well, yeah, virtual hands. And if I'll have, um, Caitlin, do you want to explain to anyone who is new to this how to raise your hand? Yeah, so there's two options. Um, if you go down to reactions, you can give me a thumbs up or you can select raise your hand. I'll take either. And then if everyone will just bear with me for a second, I'm going to make a list of everyone that we have raising their hand in order. And I'll ask the board if they have, um, if three minutes for public comment for this section is appropriate or if they wanted to adjust that. So far, I see nine, ten. And our plan was to take people in order uh, which they raised their hands. Seems the only fair way to do that. I currently have 11 with their hand raised. I'll give everyone another second. Raise your hand or give me a thumbs up. You can do that by selecting the reactions button. If you are here by phone, I'm sorry I didn't say that earlier, but if you're here by calling in, you can um, hit star three and that'll raise your hand for you. And I'm gonna mute myself for one moment and just try to call Evan. <laughs> And last chance for hand raises. Okay, I think I have my list here. And then the way that um, this is gonna work is I'm gonna lower everyone's hands now. And then um, I will go in order that we raised our hand. I'll ask you to unmute. Um, and then I'll start a timer for you. So I'm gonna share a three minute timer um, and I'll ask the participant to unmute. They can give their public comment and then we can move on to the next one. If anyone on the board has anything else they'd like to see in that process, please just let me know. And then um, I know Brian's not here, but as Brian and I and the city staff discussed when planning this meeting, uh, we're gonna allow three minutes per speaker. And on this occasion, just as we did last time, we're not gonna allow questions unless somebody has an absolute burning question, I guess, but um, we'll just confine it to the three minutes per speaker. And then we'll have our own discussion afterwards. I hope, is that okay with everyone? Hey, Tom, before we start, just so that you're aware and the board's aware, I've got a call that I've got to take if it comes in. It'll just be like a two to three minute call, but I'll just drop off um, if that call comes through. Okay, no. okay and just a FYI, I tried Evan by phone. I got no answer. Um, so I don't know. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, Caitlin, you want to call them by name? Yes, I'm going to lower everyone's hand just so that I can keep track. And then I will call by name. 
this is not your only opportunity if someone's in the room and they do want to give public comment we're going to call for it again and if i miss you once again we're going to call for it again i think i got a bunch of password hand up though, so. okay all right our first public commenter is Suzanne. I'm gonna unmute you, but give me a second so I can share the timer. Okay. And timer started, go ahead, Suzanne. Good afternoon, board members. This is Suzanne Schick. I'm a professor of medicine and I work at the University of California, San Francisco. I am here to share with you the results of the research I've been doing in public events and hospitality venues in the city of San Francisco. I have been into about five cannabis dispensaries that have on-site consumption areas. I have published two scientific papers peer-reviewed on my research so far. One of the dispensaries I studied tried to control the particles that are put into the air by consuming cannabis, by smoking, vaping, and dabbing, by banning smoking and allowing vaping and dabbing. And that was not enough in their dispensary to reduce the particle levels in the air to levels that are safe for people to work in and be around. I've been to four different dispensaries, one of them many times, others several times, that have tried to control the particles in the air, the PM 2.5, using ventilation. And none of them, again, came anywhere near, if anything, ventilation was less successful in removing the particles created by smoking. If you want hospitality venues in Boulder to be safe, we don't yet have a proven solution. People here in San Francisco are doing their best. Dispensary owners are trying to create ventilation systems that work. But when you're in the same room as people who are throwing millions of particles into the air by smoking, vaping, or dabbing, you're going to get exposed to those particles unless people take measures that I have not yet seen taken, such as combining ventilation with bans on combustion, containment, and strict limits on the number of people who are allowed to consume at the same time. I can't promise that will be entirely successful, but if you are bound and determined and absolutely sure that it is your job to allow people to basically break smoke-free laws and consume cannabis in your public places in Boulder, Colorado, then I encourage you to embark on a series of experiments combining multiple methods for controlling PM. Because using single methods, as numerous people of goodwill in San Francisco and the greater Bay Area have tried so far, has not worked. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Peter Marcus. After Peter Marcus, we I will call um, Rachel Freeman. So Peter Marcus, you should be unmuted and go ahead. Cool. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, my name is Peter Marcus. I'm the VP of Communications for Terrapin Care Station. We have two dispensaries in Boulder and hold the first adult use license for the city. I'm also a member of the board of directors of the Boulder Chamber. Terrapin actually spearheaded in 2019 the legislation in the State House that allows us to have the conversation here today. The conversation was always about opportunity. It is about taking cannabis consumption off the street, out of our parks, while providing new business opportunities for entrepreneurs who have otherwise been unable to access the industry. There are significant barriers to entering the cannabis space. Licenses are hard to come by, they're expensive. You have to be well capitalized to start a dispensary, even more for cultivation. It's a mature competitive industry. New hospitality licenses would allow those who have been unable to participate to seize a new opportunity to engage. Uh, and the possibilities are endless. We're talking entrepreneurs with backgrounds in event planning, music, culinary arts, fitness, et cetera. They could couple their existing skills with a new twist in cannabis hospitality. It's an exciting time for those waiting in the wings, so long as the city acts and actually sets these businesses up for success. 
While the current pro proposal would get us to hospitality, its burdensome restrictions would likely lead to failure. Quickly putting on my chamber hat uh, for a second, uh, let me say that as a member of the board of directors, we carefully weighed whether a cannabis hospitality policy is right for the city. We realized that regulated cannabis hospitality establishments would provide additional business opportunities for the city following what was a tough time for hospitality thanks to the pandemic. Here's the policy the chamber landed on. Given the nascent nature of this industry, we support the ongoing collaboration of a community-based and community-wide stakeholder engagement to balance the complex interaction between state law and local policies. We note that as our experience with the cannabis industry grows and initial concerns prove unfounded, it is appropriate to conduct a more thorough regulatory review when developing policies. This includes the opportunity to explore new avenues for the responsible consumption and delivery of cannabis products. Boulder's initial regulations proved excessive compared to surrounding communities, which threatened the competitiveness of our local businesses. The bottom line, the Boulder Chamber works to maintain a predictable economic climate for all businesses and industries by seeking appropriate congruence between state law and local ordinances and opposing laws and regulations based on unsubstantiated perception as opposed to fact-based concerns. That's what we're talking about here. I thank you for your consideration. As you can see, cannabis hospitality is the logical next step in our evolution to provide additional opportunity in safe and regulated spaces so long as we actually set those businesses up for success. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, next we have Rachel Freeman. And I will ask you to unmute. And I do wanna make a quick note that if you did raise your hand wanting to give public comment, I have added you to the list. I did lower your hand, so don't panic. I gotcha. Um, so Rachel Freeman is next and um, on deck is Truman Bradley after Rachel. Hello, members of the club. My name is Rachel Freeman and I am the program manager for the Tobacco Education and Prevention Partnership at Boulder County Public Health. Our program serves Boulder County communities by providing resources that support individuals in quitting tobacco, reducing tobacco related health disparities, reducing youth initiation of tobacco and vaping products, and reducing exposure to secondhand smoke. I'm here today to oppose the city of Boulder opting into cannabis social consumption sites due to the negative health impacts that secondhand marijuana smoke and vaping aerosol will have on employees, youth, and adult residents of Boulder. Though more research is needed on the long-term health implications of secondhand marijuana exposure, Evidence shows that secondhand marijuana smoke has many of the same chemicals as tobacco smoke. And you heard some of these facts from my colleague Suzanne, and you'll hear from others today as well. Allowing marijuana smoking and vaping can have negative health implications for employees by leaving them unprotected from exposure. From tobacco prevention best practice, we know that smoke-free policies are associated with reduced secondhand smoke exposure, decreased adverse health effects, and a decrease in youth prevalence among young people. Over the last 15 years, our program at Boulder County Public Health, in partnership with the community, has worked really hard to establish smoke-free policies in Boulder, including many outdoor locations such as restaurant patios and the downtown business district. The presence of cannabis social consumption in the community would further denormalize marijuana use and decrease the perception of harm among young people. To protect health and ensure consistency, marijuana, in addition to tobacco and nicotine, should be included in smoke-free and vapor-free protections in public places and workplaces. We believe that allowing cannabis social consumption businesses is a step back and really weakens the policies that we've worked hard to put in place in the way of clean air protections and youth prevention in smoking and substance use. Again, I thank you for your thoughtfulness and the time and the energy and effort that you put into the development of the package of recommendations that will go to city council. We really do appreciate the time you dedicated to this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And I just realized that I, when I thanked Peter, I might've been muted. So thank you, Peter, also. 
Thank you. Next, we have um, Truman Bradley, and on deck after Truman Bradley is Gregory Topol. Truman, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Truman Bradley. I'm the executive director of the Marijuana Industry Group, the trade association for Colorado cannabis businesses. Our members are all across the state and include half a dozen licensed in Boulder. Prior to serving in this role, I owned and operated a grow facility in Boulder for nine years. I also grew up in Boulder and attended Southern Hills Middle School, Fairview, and then CU for both undergrad and B school. We commend the club on recommending marijuana hospitality and would suggest that as the city moves forward that you please consider hospitality licensure through an equity lens. That said, I'm deeply concerned about the recommended ban on adults age 21 through 24, as well as the prohibitions on edibles and concentrates. These policies equate to Prohibition 2.0, a flawed and outdated position, and one that's very unpopular among Boulder voters. According to polling done in 2021, 85% of Colorado Democrats support legal marijuana. In regards to the age limit, let's not have an emperor's new clothes situation where we pretend that adults in their early 20s don't consume cannabis in Boulder. Of course they do. I did it in Boulder in my early 20s and I promise you it's the same today. 21 to 24 year olds are the exact people who should be provided a safe place to consume. A hospitality lounge can help monitor younger patrons and make sure they're not driving home impaired a value that passed unanimously in this committee. Prohibiting younger adults from marijuana hospitality will not stop them from consuming. They'll just be more likely to do it in their cars or on Pearl Street or potentially in the presence of minors. A lounge guarantees there won't be minors present. The logic against prohibition is the exact same for bans on vapes, concentrates, and edibles. While MIG disagrees with the premise that concentrates and vapes are more harmful than other consumption methods, even if you think that, you should allow concentrate consumption. Adults of all ages are going to consume these products anyway. Please allow them to do so safely away from kids and in a place where impairment can be monitored. Lastly, CLAB's recommendation to ban edibles is nonsensical. Edibles do have a delayed onset when compared to smoking, but the delay is typically about 45 to 60 minutes something that the hospitality businesses and consumers are well aware of and can adjust to. The recommendations should instead be around edibles purchase limits and times, as the effects of edibles typically wear off in about two and a half hours. The edibles ban is especially ridiculous since you're approving beverages. There's no effective difference between a marijuana soda and a gummy. In conclusion, I commend you for starting the process to legalize hospitality. Please amend the policy to permit all legal forms of cannabis and allow all legal adults to safely consume. Lastly, please consider social equity in your recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Truman. Excuse me, one second. Okay, next we have Gregory Topol. I'll ask you to unmute. And on deck, we have Liz Zawoski. Hello, my name is Greg Topel. I'm fortunate enough to be one of the managers over at Stella's Cucina. Um, uh, I wanted to share um, how things have been going so far. We've been open for just under two months now and have uh, exceeded all of our expectations in the response that we're getting from the community. It has been um, very evident that it is something that the Boulder is very hungry for. Um, the elements of the aesthetics and the service and the food and the music, uh, it's just been wildly, wildly well received. Um, and we are incredibly grateful for it. It feels important to mention that, um, that this concept is, um, has been exceeding our expectations. Now we've got a team of incredibly seasoned individuals. Uh, Stella Spanu, the owner, has spared no expense um, in 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 uh, gathering one of the most pedigreed staffs and supervisors and management teams that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Um, truly seasoned professionals. Um, each member of our team is TIP certified. Um, we have a recurring TIP certification program that takes care it takes place um, every ninety days within our building. Um, the level of uh, 
of Stella's dedication to this community and um, the level of uh, long-term thinking applied to all that she has done and all that she is doing, um, it, it felt important for me to bring that to the table. Um, this is this is a this is an innovative concept and um, and a, and a first time concept for Stella and uh, Jason, the owners. But uh, it it's it, the 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 level of professionalism, the serious nature with which they take it, and their truly truly benevolent intent uh, it really needs to be talked about from the treetops, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I am. Uh, Again, feeling incredibly fortunate to be a part of this very, very special and, and possibly historic kind of um, transformative concept. And uh, I, I felt the need to make sure that uh, I told the larger community of uh, what's going on within those four walls. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you. Next, we have Liz Zukowski. And on deck, we have Henny Lackley. And Liz, you should be on. Okay, thanks, Caitlin. Uh, my name is Liz Zukowski. I am the Policy and Public Affairs Manager for Native Roots Cannabis Company. We are a vertically integrated operator with 20 locations across the state, two of which are in the city of Boulder. I'd like to start by thanking all of you club members for your diligence in researching and analyzing hospitality programs nationwide and your thoughtfulness in considering how those programs could influence hospitality in Boulder. After reviewing the recommendations made for city council, I'm sharing the following suggestions to improve the proposal. The bans on concentrate use and non-drinkable edibles feel misguided. Vape pens are very popular, especially among novice users, because users can easily self-titrate to receive the desired amount of product and the desired effect, but these would be banned under the current proposal. Additionally, allowing vape usage in hospitality establishments will help curb vaping in unsanctioned areas. An alternative idea is to ban the use of open flames and dab rigs while not completely banning concentrate use. Chewable edibles are not less predictable or less consistent than drinkable edibles. Um, all edible products go through the same rigorous testing, packaging, and labeling requirements that are set by the state. Further, many of the edibles on the market today are considered fast acting, and the desired effect comes on in 10 to 15 minutes and lasts two, maybe three hours. Providing legal and regulated environments for vape and edible consumption with knowledgeable staff encouraging responsible consumption and promoting the start low, go slow message is a superior public health and safety policy over outright prohibition of these products. The recommendation that patrons must be 25 or older to enter should be reduced to 21 years old to align with state law. 21 to 24 year olds in Boulder likely rent their home as I did when I lived in Boulder. Um, many landlords have restrictions on cannabis use in the dwelling, as my landlord did when I lived in Boulder. Limiting hospitality access to patrons that are 25 or older does not solve the issue for the 21 to 24 year, old, year olds who are legally allowed to consume, but are left with no real options for where they can legally consume. I ask that you consider the message you're sending to Boulder residents and constituents regarding the use of cannabis versus the use of alcohol. On my 21st birthday, I paraded up and down Pearl Street, uh, stopping at nearly every bar, and most of them provided me with a free shot of liquor to celebrate. This is a widely accepted practice in Boulder and across the country. A young person would view the age disparity for entering a bar versus a hospitality establishment as a de facto endorsement to use one substance, alcohol, over another substance, cannabis. I'll leave you with this. According to the CDC, 2,200 people die from alcohol poisoning annually in the US and zero people die annually from consuming regulated cannabis. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Next we have Penny Lasley. I'll ask you to unmute. And on deck we have Shar Depp. Good afternoon, members of the club. My name is Henny Lassley, and I'm a co-founder and executive director of an organization called One Chance to Grow Up. We are a statewide organization that looks out for the public health and safety of youth as marijuana 
and marijuana products continue to be readily available and commercialized. First, we appreciate the steps for public health and safety that the collab has taken if you do intend, as you do intend to make recommendations to city council. However, we must look beyond this. In January of this year, the CDOT announced that 745 individuals lost their lives on Colorado roadways. <clears throat> we must ask ourselves the most important question. Will hospitality licenses contribute to this sobering statistic? CDOT will be the first to tell you that the agency has spent millions of tax dollars on working to change behavior of those who consume THC and then drive. THC impaired fatalities have increased 63% over the prior year and dual youth of, al of alcohol and THC increased 25%. 22% of deaths involve those outside of the vehicle, including pedestrians, cyclists, and motor motorcyclists. Think about the Boulder way of life and how many of your citizens and students, both high school and university, fit into this category. Marijuana edibles pr do present another danger due to delayed impairment. According to the state health department, the delayed onset is anywhere between four and six hours. The Buffalo Highway is a terrible place for an edible to reach the maximum impairment. Increased marijuana commercialization sends the wrong message to kids. Adding consumption sites will increase sales density by creating additional sales of THC. A RAND report showed that young people um, aged 18 to 22 have lived in neighborhoods with more marijuana commercialization use marijuana more frequently than their peers and have a more positive view of the drug. According to monitor the, Monitoring the Future out of the University of Michigan, past year, past month, and daily marijuana use reached the highest levels ever recorded since these trends were first monitored in 1988. Marijuana use in the past month was reported by 29% of young adults in 2021 compared to 21% five years ago and 17% 10 years ago. One chance puts kids and communities first instead of those looking to profit from additional sales. For these reasons, we stand in opposition of Boulder going forward with host hospitality licenses. To our knowledge, if the data were actually in existence that this would alleviate um, outdoor smoking, we would definitely take a different position, but to our knowledge, no such data are available. Thank you again, and we do recommend the collab look to what's best for your entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Henny. Thank you. Next, we have Char. Char Day. I'll ask you to unmute. And on deck, we have Jonathan Stinger. Thank you, Caitlin. My name is Char Day, and I represent American Nonsmokers Rights Foundation. And I, I really do want to thank you guys for you members of CLAB for your extremely thoughtful, diligent work on this important issue. And our foundation is not anti-cannabis use for personal choices by adults, just not using it in ways that harm others. So not using it in ways that harm others. We are opposed to Boulder opting in to social consumption of cannabis marijuana because <clears throat> doing so would create a new unprotected class of workers, those in the social consumption industry, and everyone deserves to work in a smoke-free workplace. Smoke is smoke. Let's put people over profit. Secondhand marijuana smoke is every bit as harmful as tobacco smoke. And uh, just so folks know, Pearl Street is a smoke-free zone. And our foundation will continue to speak up on this issue. Thank you again. Thank you, Shar. Thank you. And I do want to point out that Member Anderson did join us um, before Shar spoke around 3.38. Um, next, we have Jonathan Singer. I'll ask you to unmute. And on deck, we have Bea Campbell. Good afternoon, members of the CLAB. I'm Jonathan Singer, the Senior Director of Policy Programs for the Boulder Chamber of Commerce. I'm also the author of the legislation that uh, enacted the opportunity for local governments to be able to opt in to the hospitality model. Uh, but before that, I wanted to give you a little history of who I am and what brought me here today. Uh, I graduated from Fairview High School 
And in my time at Fairview High School, I spent my time volunteering for causes that I cared about, including uh, working in the world of uh, social justice and social work, where I eventually got my degree in social work at Colorado State University, trying to return to Boulder only to find that housing costs went up a little bit more than I could expect. And now I reside with my family in Longmont. I spent the uh, next 10 years of my life actually working on college campus drug courts, working with youth in, at risk, uh, and in our truancy courts. And so um, what I, when I finally was elected to office, I came to the conclusion that we needed to start to treat marijuana like the drug it is and not the drug that some people fear it to be. The reason that I say that is while working with youth at risk, the risks of marijuana were so overstated that my youth didn't understand what to believe and what not to believe. This opportunity that the CLAB has today is about ensuring that we can do uh, a legal behavior in a regulated environment with the best safeguards possible without further pushing things underground or making a drug scarier than it really turns out to be. We hear about perception of risk. Perception of risk is incredibly important, but we heard 20 years ago that per as perception of risk goes down, use goes up. We haven't seen those numbers since marijuana has been legalized. What is important is ensuring that the CLAB is able to pass on recommendations to the city council as it was charged with over two years ago to allow this public process to continue to ensure that everybody is able to make their voice heard on this. What's unfortunate is the consumers of cannabis are still discriminated against. You're not gonna hear from a lot of them today because they fear losing their jobs, they fear losing their livelihoods, and they fear losing their families sometimes. We have still a criminal justice system that unfairly discriminates against marijuana consumers and not having social establishments similar to what you've uh, laid out here today only further allows that perception of risk to continue. So I look forward to the conversation. I look forward to listening in and thank you. Please pass these recommendations on. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Next we have Bia Campbell. I'll ask you to unmute. And on deck, we have Nick Torres. My name is Bia Campo. I'm an associate with VS Strategies, a public policy consultant firm that works with businesses, industry associations, and governments on adopting responsible cannabis policy. We represent Stella's Cucina, a restaurant currently operating in Boulder who wishes to open a marijuana hospitality establishment. We have been following CLAP's process in hosp and hospitality discussion for the past two years. And we're thankful for CLAP's time and thoughtfulness over this time and appreciate the board's volunteer work. While we do not agree with all the decisions made by the board, we respect the process and the intensive time and discussions that happened to arrive at this point. On May 3rd, 2021, almost two years ago, CLAP held an initial public hearing on the topic of marijuana hospitality. And at that point, community members in favor of hospitality were in the majority. Considering past elections and votes on marijuana issues, we believe that the Boulder community has a historical track of being in favor of fair and responsible marijuana policies. We also know that between 22 and 25% of Boulder County's population are current cannabis consumers. We believe that the majority of Boulder residents would be in favor of adopting reasonable and responsible policies to allow for marijuana hospitality, hospitality licenses within the city. Considering the 24 months of discussion, the marijuana industry, our friends, allies, consumers, and businesses opted to be respectful of CLAP's time and decided to not have a multitude of speakers here today, trying to influence policy decisions that were solidified, discussed to exhaustion by this board. It is our hope that today, CLAP can vote to move this process forward and recommend the policies outlined in your memo, memo to city council. We thank you for your time and commit, commitment to the Boulder community. Thank you, Bia. Thank you. 
Next, we have Nick Torres. I'll ask you to unmute. And on deck, we have Pete Bielek. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nick Torres. I am advocacy director of the American Lung Association in Colorado and also a proud Boulder resident. Um, here to relay um, the Lung Association's concerns with the CLAB moving forward with recommendations that would represent um, a major step backward for public health uh, for Boulder residents. Um, Smoke-free air laws have a long history of having a positive public health impact on the residents of communities with strong smoke-free air protections. And um, we would certainly oppose any changes to Boulder's law that would allow um, on-site consumption for burning or vaping of marijuana. Uh, whether we're talking about tobacco smoke, marijuana smoke, wildfire smoke, or a neighbor's uh, leaf pile smoke, um, you know, smoke, inhaling smoke is harmful to the human body. And um, fortunately, we've had uh, now nearly a generation of Boulderites growing up in a community where um, public tobacco smoke is uh, just not something that they come across. You know, we're not um, asking folks smoking or non-smoking um, when we go into a restaurant anymore. Uh, and, and I think that part of the, the challenge that we have to overcome in the public health community is educating um, on the perceptions, um, changing the perceptions of, of marijuana smoke. I think we've done so much in regards to changing public perceptions um, around tobacco smoke over the last generations that we now find ourselves um, having to educate um, that inhaling marijuana smoke is not um, a healthy way to engage in marijuana consumption. Um, there are many, many well-documented impacts on the cardiovascular and pulmonary systems at the individual level. And we would certainly support ongoing um, research into the effects um, at the public health level of, uh, of marijuana smoke and, and vaping. However, uh, there is an abundance of evidence recognizing um, that, that smoke is smoke is smoke when it comes to inhaling particulate matter um, that is a negative impact on public health. Um, and so the Lung Association will look forward to continuing to monitor this process. We will continue to advocate for members of the public, for example, a, a family um, with children with asthma who can no longer open their windows um, because they might be downwind from an on-site consumption hospitality licensee. Um, those stories um, are not something we deal with in Colorado. We deal with them in many other places where um, smoking is still more commonplace. And so we would hope that Boulder would protect the smoke-free air law and not allow um, on-site consumption with smoking and vaping. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Um, next we have Pete Bielik and on deck we have Don Rainfield. Hello, this, my name is Pete Bialik. Thank you for your time, members of the CLIB. I am the president of the Group to Alleviate Smoking Pollution, GASPA Colorado, a nonprofit organization founded in 1977, and that has been in Boulder since I moved here in 1983. Our mission is to protect the public from exposure to any type of secondhand smoke or vape at work in public places and in multi-unit housing through education and advocacy. GASP has some concerns about allowing any indoor or outdoor social consumption. Under our current smoking and vaping regulations, the most complaints GASP receives are about tobacco and marijuana smoke drifting into businesses, drifting into homes, apartments, and outdoor settings. And we have had people complain about marijuana smoke coming into their homes, even in Boulder. I do think that outdoor consumption uh, I do not think that outdoor social consumption will change that problem unless it's limited to remote areas. Furthermore, social consumption would weaken the current smoking regulations we have in Boulder. So I think the city council would need to approve it by a two thirds vote or put it on the ballot because uh, in 1995, a ballot measure was passed 
uh, regulating smoking in Boulder by the people of Boulder by 55%. There's no safe exposure to secondhand smoke, as has already been said, and it has some of the same chemicals. I think people who deliver goods or services and all workers deserve to be protected from secondhand smoke. GASP does not oppose the use of marijuana products indoors or outdoors that are an alternative to smoking or vaping like infused beverages and tinctures. And those can be found in soda pops, coffee drinks, juices, seltzers, beers. I read online that weed drinks and tinctures could take effect within 30 minutes, but somebody else said it can act faster. And I've read also that they those can last two to four hours. Um, you know, that's where the industry should concentrate if they're really concerned about their workers and exposing other people to secondhand smoke. We do not entirely oppose allowing smoking or vaping out in outdoor settings, not visible to the public, that can be controlled in such a way that it does not drift into other public places or workplaces, and that can minimize the health dangers to workers. The Chamber of Commerce often has promoted Boulder as one of the healthiest places to live in the United States. I hope we can keep it that way. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. And next we have John Reinfeld. I'll ask you to unmute. And on deck we have Julie uh, Drewfeld. And I do want to call if anyone else would like to make public comments. So these are the last two on our list. Anyone else would like to make public comment, please raise your hand or give me a thumbs up and I'll add you to the list. And Don, I'm asking you to unmute. Hi, my name is Dawn Reinfeld and I am the executive director of Blue Rising. We strongly oppose opting into social consumption in the city of Boulder and will urge the city council to opt out. We appreciate that the club intentionally excluded high potency THC products from its recommendations, but we maintain that allowing any marijuana consumption in our restaurants and bars would be extremely problematic with no upside for the broader community. One of the arguments for opting in is that providing places for legal consumption might decrease illegal consumption, but there is no evidence to support this theory. In communities with social consumption, like Las Vegas and West Hollywood, the odor of illegal consumption is still as strong as ever. Our community is in the midst of a mental health and addiction crisis. Colorado adolescents use marijuana Use of marijuana is 43% higher than the national average. The presence of consumption venues in prominent locations would further normalize marijuana use, which is particularly problematic for our young people who are vulnerable to its mental health risks. Boulder is already struggling to deal with this addiction crisis, and contrary to the myth that marijuana is not addictive, even the state of Colorado now warns that THC is addictive and can cause serious mental health impacts like psychosis. Boulder does not have the resources to deal with our current level of addiction and mental health impacts. We should not be encouraging more use for our youth. Boulder doesn't need to lead the way on social consumption sites. We are about health, fitness, and vitality, not smoking and leaning into drug culture. We need to be listening to the families that are raising kids here, not the interests of an industry that profits from addiction. Blue Rising advocates on behalf of many Colorado families who have been impacted. We will continue to be active in this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Our last speaker is Julie. Julie Driefeld, and I'll ask you to unmute and um, I'll call again. If anyone else would like to give public comment, please raise your hand and I'll add you to the list. Julie, you should be unmuted. Thank you. My name is Julie Dreifold, and I'm representing myself today. Um, first and foremost, I really appreciate that CLAB has chosen to exclude these high THC marijuana products from your recommendations. As there are significant mental health concerns about these high THC products. Uh, as has been stated by previous testimony, uh, CDPHE has sub issued substantial health warnings around THC, including 
um, that it can cause acute psychotic symptoms, hallucinations, paranoia, uh, and the possibility of developing a schizophrenic um, disorder in adulthood if used as adolescents and kids. Um, I'm a parent of a CU Boulder junior and a resident of Colorado, and I am opposed to Boulder opting into social consumption um, because of growing access to marijuana and other substances to those under 21 in our beloved state is shocking and substantial. We ate at the sink last weekend and the observation of underage drug use I encountered on the Hill in just about 55 minutes was very troubling. CU has poured millions of dollars into campaigns like Be Boulder, which tends to lean away from the party school image and tells CU's Boulder's better story, their stronger story to advance the school's reputation, retention, engagement goals, and reputation. All of these, which will only benefit the greater Boulder community. The city should not undermine these efforts by opting into commercialization and cons social consumption. As most of you are aware, the US Surgeon General states that no amount of marijuana use is safe for the developing brain of our adolescent. And science tells us that the brain is in formation until one's mid to late 20s. So I applaud the 25 plus um, age demographic that you're looking at. But creating these additional outlets with this increase in commer commercialization for all of Boulder students sends the wrong message. The elementary age kids, middle schoolers, the students at Boulder and Fairview and our CU cohort suggest to them that marijuana is safe. A study in LA concluded as marijuana outlets open and expand after legalization, it showed the association of density with greater intensity of use among young adults and adolescents. As you know, adding marijuana social consumption will increase density, additional licenses, and create these marijuana mini marts in already existing stores. As the school superintendent told me several years ago, Legalized marijuana only brings more marijuana to our communities and to our kids. Take heed, Boulder, and protect our community's greatest effort, assets, I'm sorry, our children, our kids, and our students. For these reasons, I hope the city council will reject the idea of opting into social consumption. And please know I will continue to speak up on this issue. Thank you so much for all your work. Thank you, Julie. Are there any other speakers? I do see other names that have not spoken. Chance, here's your chance. You can give me a thumbs up or raise your hand. If you're calling in using a phone number, you can push star three to raise your hand. I don't see any other hands being raised. Okay. All right, let's close public comment and go on to discussion. Um, I'd almost, I know it's premature, but Brian's gonna be able to join us momentarily, I hope. Um, what would you think about taking a break? Just a short break right now. I'll check in with Brian, um, just as I checked with Alana and Evan, and see if he can join us for discussion. Uh, my understanding was that he might be as late as four thirty, so that's thirty minutes. It seems. Well, I was going to check. It with may him right. just. I was going to check with him right now and see. That'll give me a chance to do that. Just a short break. Find me, Chair. All right, let me I'll just like, let's say 4.05. Give, give you a chance to get something to eat before we discuss. A quick snack. Okay, 4.05.
All right, for those that can hear us, come on back. Although if they had their audio on, they would have heard recording in progress. Okay, I think we have a quorum. And um, Brian said he'll be, he's on his way home, driving home right now. He'll be here within about five to seven-ish minutes. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. And um, first of all, uh, speaking on behalf of all of the club members, I would um, like to show gratitude to all the speakers for their insight and information and their passion. And so we will take that all into account as we discuss the recommendations. So we didn't really have a way to go through this other than go through them, but we've already discussed them and voted on them. And so I, I, I guess I would love to um, keep comments brief um, so that we can make it all the way through. And then hopefully, as am I right, Kristen, that our timeline is good if we, I'm looking for Kristen's face, but not seeing it, um, that our plan was to finish them this time and present them to city council in the near future. That's Bennett. correct, Tom. So the proposed Here. timeline was to finalize the recommendations um, in April and, and then present those to council. Excuse me, finalize the recommendations in March, present them to council in April. Um, and that's especially um, helpful for the members who may be leaving the board because we do have, um, we may have one or two new board members coming in April. Um, so now may be the last time for the current board to have these conversations with the existing board members. Does everyone understand that? New board members will be appointed mid-month. And I was gonna wait till later, but Alana, I was gonna um, also express gratitude for all the years, years you've Put towards this because as I understand you did not reapply is that correct yeah that's correct and I I should have done my homework before I tried to do this but how many years did you put in to map um that began in 2016 so it's been seven years okay the break so, between map and club you've been working on this as long as if not longer than most of us, obviously. And so I think the city of Boulder should you know, be thankful to you and we're all thankful to you. So did you wanna did you want to do any? Well, I, let's wait till the end. If you, you can decide whether you wanna say anything special at the end, but um, anyways, uh, does anyone else have any insight as to how to go about this? Okay, um, so if we use as a common document, let me just pull up. Is it in here or do I have to open a page? I think I probably have to open a page. Is that right? Or... Um, the full text of the memo is in your reading packet. That's what and I thought. Additionally, the link, if anyone wanted to just follow along on the Google Doc, the link is there as well. What page is it in the reading packet? Page 33. I'm almost there. And while the chair is writing that page, I will let everyone know that uh, member Vice Chair Keegan is speaking. Welcome, Brian. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I apologize for my tardiness. Life happens. Okay, um, 
if I if we go through it motion by motion, the intention is not to change the vote. I mean, I, mean, I think we've already done that, but um, we can have a discussion just in general about the issues. Brian, did you have any idea on how to go about this? I am just getting settled in, so I'm probably not the correct person <laughs> to answer. Okay. All right. So the first one's easy. Uh, motion one. Um, we opted out of mobile or bring your own cannabis hospitality. And it was unanimous. And unless there's further discussion on that, then we can move on to motion two. I'm gonna to try to keep, I really wish I had more than one screen, but darn. I was just gonna ask, would the board prefer that I share this document or are you okay to reference it on your own? Um, you put, so you're gonna put it up as a um, exhibit or? Yeah, I can share it on the, screen? on the screen if you'd like. Sure, anyone opposed to that? Why not? I mean, it's in the packet, which people could have, people probably did or could have accessed, but still, why not? Okay. Well, you're going to have to make the size right. Perfect. Does that look good? Looks good. Okay. Uh, so, motion two. It's going way back in time now. So this, the motion two and motion three kind of go hand in hand. It was kind of the same vote relatively twice. And the first vote was to continue discussion and opt in. And then the second vote, um, really was just to kind of clarify that further discussion needs to occur, which would, it was going to happen anyway. So um, so unless somebody has more to say about this, we can go on to more um, topical things, I guess. That sound okay? See, I can't see everybody's face when that's up on the screen. That's the only problem. And if somebody, oh, Sandra. Um, yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, I'm just wondering, just as a suggestion, and and of course I welcome the board's thoughts on this, but is there any reason to keep any motions that failed on on this? Um, is there any value in that or does it create more confusion or some confusion? And by asking that question, you're hoping to simplify it for city council? So well, that... yeah, I mean, I just, um, I guess I just want to make sure that it's in a format that um, will be helpful to council and, um, and, and maybe it's just, um, if you wanted to keep it in there, um, if, if you think that there's some value in doing that, then that's fine, but maybe um, uh, highlighting the ones that did pass uh, just to kind of differentiate so they don't kind of get mixed in together. Um, so it's a little bit of just sort of some formatting um, concerns that I have that I think uh, we can address. Um, but I think it'd be important to get the board's input on that in terms of how that looks. Um, and then the other thing I would say too, is that um, just in terms of sharing this document, it, it, it would be helpful, I think, at the very beginning to kind of have a little bit of background about why this document is coming to them. And if there is an ask, what that ask is. So maybe, you all can think about that as we're working th through the motions, but I do think that um, 
you know, they're, they're not going to really, well, some of them may, but, but some may not know why this is coming to them. Yeah, what's going to, my plan was to have that discussion towards the end of this, but that's okay. That I mean, it's an important part of this. Um, so just for clarification, if we were to take a, um, either change the order or I'm not sure if I heard you say is do not present the failed motions. I think it would be missing some substance, but we could regroup things and put the failed and one withdrawn motion towards the end, something like that. But Robin and then Alana. Okay, um, Sandra brought up two different things. I just want to speak first to the first thing she brought up about whether we should include failed motions in this memo. And I think there, this first one that we're looking at on page one, motion three, um, I do see where that doesn't add a lot to the conversation. That's hard to explain. There's not context behind it. It just kind of sits there in a weird way. But there are other failed motions later, like on page two, motion five, um, and page two, motion seven. Those are substantive and probably should be represented in this document because they show that we were looking at the you know full product type. So I, I do think that first one though could be eliminated without um, you know causing harm to this overall document and what we're trying to do. And that one is motion three. Okay. And did you want to speak about the second issue or just stay with the first issue? No, I, I agree with the second issue as well. We, we definitely need to tee this up at the beginning. My only re request is that it be just a very straightforward, non-persuasive type language in the beginning. This is why CLAP's been meeting. These are our recommendations. Um, and we wanted to provide context to the full balance of our conversation. I think it can be pretty straightforward. Okay, Alana. Yeah, I agree with Robin on her comments um, as well. I just wanted to make sure that all the board members wanted to go through these motions one by one before we did that, because it just seems really exhaustive. And I thought we did that at like the last meeting. Um, maybe we could gather which motions we, I don't know, just kind of a pull the membership and before we just go one by one, or if there's a purpose to going one by one through them. Did, maybe I missed that. Well, I'd like to hear from others, but I guess my point of view is that we heard some passionate speakers addressing certain aspects of cert, of specific motions, um, like motion five that Robin just mentioned, or the age-related motion. And it seems like it would do service to the people that spoke passionately to take their comments and just at least touch bases on those motions and this is the way to make sure that we get to each each of those anyone so I'm looking for for desired changes because i feel like we've also all had multiple opportunities that we've raised to reconsider some of these, but um, even despite individual board member efforts to look at these on both sides, you know, at, take another glance at them, we've continually decided to uh, keep them as is. So, I mean, are you saying that we're reconsidering these one by one based on the topics that we heard from public comment? Um. I'm not wedded to any particular way to do this. Um, I guess I just wanted to give merit to the speakers that spoke. I mean, we could, we, I mean, alternatively, choosing an extreme scenario, if we didn't hear any game changers, if no one heard any game changers in the speakers today, then we could just approve the whole uh, list of recommendations in mass. 
What do, what do others want to do? Stacy, I want to hear from you, Brian, Michael, everyone. I don't, I don't have everybody on my screen right now, so. It looks like member Anderson. Look like Jesse. Member Keegan, what? I looked like Mr. or Member Anderson had his hand up there. Give me a thumbs up. Oh, okay. See, I can't see that right now. <laughs> no, I, I am in very loud airport, so I will spare you guys all of my <laughs> extended conversation here. But I think we have delivered this conversation for many, in fact, many years at this point. And I think. Evan, just, Evan, one, been Evan, one moment. Recorded. Evan, Evan, can you hear me? So just to help explain, Evan's on an airplane, I believe, um, and his audio is marginal, including your audio coming to us is marginal. I don't know if you can hear that, but um, so- Evan, maybe go um, off video to speak. Say it again. I did not who I did not see who said that and I did not hear what that was. Is that you, Caitlin? No, sorry. Um, Member Anderson, yeah, if you turn your camera off, it might be easier for you for us to hear you. Who could try that? You want to give that a try, Evan? How about now? Can you can you guys oh, hear me at all? Much better, much better. Much better. Okay. I took out my Bluetooth and now I'm just holding my mouth real close to the phone. Um I, I, my only point would be that I think we've, we've exhaustively discussed all of this. I think both, both sides of every opinion have been pretty well documented in our record. And I think it would be appropriate for us to approve this memo in whole. Obviously, I think there's some things I would like to change and revisit, but I think that's the, that is the process for, for us to pursue when this comes in front of council. I think at this point, it would be appropriate for us to move to make this recommendation as a wholesale document. We've all had our opportunities and I just don't think it's valuable to do It's my take. We were good on the audio until the last sentence. I just don't think it's necessary for us to revisit each one of these individually. I would like to I would like to approve this memo in whole and send it off to council. Okay, Michael. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, I agree with Alana. I agree with Evan. I agree with Robin. Um, and to um, council's point, um, I'm not necessarily, well, I, I would be opposed to sending forth to council just those motions that have passed. I think at least for, for me from um, not only a, a personal but also professional perspective it's important to me that i think council sees um at least how i voted on these different motions that they're going to be considering so i would i would ask that we keep um the format as it is showing those motions that passed and which members voted for, to pass and which mo mo members voted to uh, not pass each motion it is noted that evan just gave a thumbs up <laughs> Kate? Yeah, um, I was just going to say, kind of just highlighting, you know, or just um, saying that I agree that um, the motion three, I think, um, is, is not very helpful. I think it's more confusing than, um, so I agree with Robin, that that, that could be um, removed. Um, I also think that, I think that the failed, I think a lot of people agree, and we've kind of talked about wanting the failed ones to be there. So I think that I, you know, would, you know, I support that because um, we've had multiple conversations about making sure that everybody's voices is heard. Um, I think that's part of it. Um, I do also like um, Sandra's idea of highlighting the past ones in some way. I don't know what that looks like, but maybe all of the past ones look a little different than the ones that failed um, so that they pop out a little bit. Um, I'm not really sure if we can highlight the rows in, in, in this way. That might be a little tacky, but um, there's got to be a way that maybe we can make them a little bit more uh, pronounced. Um, and then um, I was going to just mention there's a couple of um, I mean, I, however you guys want to, or y'all want to do it, whether we go through each one or not, I don't know that that's necessary. 
I was only going to mention that number 14, motion number 14. We have number 22 that's also about hours. I just didn't know if we wanted to make some notation um, that led to that next um, for connected 14 and 22 in some way. Um, that, that was my only comment about anything that's on this sheet, but I'm happy to follow whatever everybody thinks in terms of the process, but just wanted to mention those three things. You want to scroll down to 22 also there, Caitlin? So just it says in the notes, it says motion was reconsidered or a uh, reconsideration of motion 14, but motion 14 doesn't say anything about motion 22. So we could combine those. Um, to, I, I, I feel like I'm being the devil's advocate, but there was a suggestion by one speaker, I can't remember who now, and was keeping notes, but um, someone who spoke passionately for allowing edibles to be consumed maybe until a, a, a lesser hour. So just to make sure people don't want to revisit any of these issues, Robin. Yeah, Tom, I think we've been clear we're not revisiting the issues for debate, but back to Kate's point on clarity within the document. I think I agree with you, Kate. I think as one suggestion would be that where we have motion 14 on page three, that we follow that and maybe just make a parenthetical remark that says, um, you know, later revisited, and then this is what passed was 22. And I do think them being separate is confusing and that could be helpful. Well, and then with respect to the comment um, Kate just made, I mean, it, I don't think it's tacky if we just take the document and however it's gonna be presented to city council, we could bold the, word passed um, under each one that passed or something like that. I was saying the highlighting might be tacky, but <laughs> you okay. could, um, yeah. Um, I, think um, you're, I think you're right. Highlighting just confused us in the past. Others? Stacy, Allison, Stacy. I am on the same page as far as um, what most people are saying. We don't need to maybe rehash this point by point. We've done that. I really appreciate all the people who did come to speak. Um, there were some ideas that were interesting, but I think you know one of the things we have talked about as we've gone through our discourse on these different motions is that none of this is like set in stone forever. We're looking at a starting point. Some of this is more intended that way. Like if we're gonna do this, maybe we should start here before we start here, right? Like, and I think to the people in the public who are worried about what we're not allowing, I think, you know, we wanna, if we're going to try and do it or recommend that we do it in Boulder, that we do it in as titrated a way, therefore hopefully as safe as a way as possible. Um, so I don't think we need to go back through anything there. I, I agree with what you just said, Tom, about you know the speaker on the edibles. That's a really interesting idea that hopefully we can keep on file, so to speak, somewhere because I think those kinds of things, if this ends up going forward in Boulder, are the things that we are going to want to revisit at some point. And these were really important points that we heard from um, the speakers today. So as far as the actual structure of the document itself, um, maybe using a lighter color text, a grayed out kind of text for the ones that didn't pass versus just regular black text for the ones that did. I don't know, I, I agree, highlighting can get kind of intense. So maybe doing it that way, but I'm on the same page as far as having them all appear because I think like Robin was saying, there's an important, and Michael, I think said the same thing, like, there's important counterpoints to all of these things, whether it passed or not. I think it's important that council understand all of it. Um, 
the only other thought I had that could work on that end was maybe doing like, here's the ones that passed, here's the ones that failed, like kind of break the whole document. Like, so there's two sections, um, but I, I'm not really attached to any particular thing. Um, I think they're going to have to kind of dig into this document no matter what. And, you know, we could either leave it or try different highlighting formats or whatever. Um, but I don't think we need to revisit every single issue unless there's any board member that feels compelled to talk about something in particular or revisit it, I guess. Brian? Yeah, I'll just close out. I agree that we don't, like with other board members, that uh, we don't necessarily to visit every uh, motion that's been discussed here. We've all been, had an opportunity to hear from public comment and experts, to say our own piece here, have that be documented. Um, I'm also a little bit reluctant to get into the weeds about formatting choices here, because I think that'll just introduce additional delays uh, in the approval process here. So I'm inclined just to approve the document uh, as is so that uh, the expertise and the perspectives on this board can be brought to other matters that are pressing uh, in this space. Um, and yeah, that's all I got. I would ask a question to Sandra, Kristen, Caitlin, Rewa, and I thought there was besides uh, Pam there I thought there were initially was another person representing the city um, but I do not see that person anymore um, just to give merit to the speakers that did speak not only this time but the previous time um, our minutes do not summarize those comments is that right I see you moving your head a little bit, Kristen. That's correct. Our, our minutes um, likely will summarize every single comment we received because we do record these meetings and make right. the recordings available if someone did want to listen to the details of every comment we, we received today. Um, Caitlin, feel free to add anything to that if you'd like. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Our practice is to um, record action minutes, meaning that we create minutes based on whatever actions the boards took. So um, we don't document in word specific okay. discussions, but all of that can be revisited. Okay, it's so correct, correct me if I'm wrong, if and when this goes to city council, which I'm hoping and assuming will be soon, um, people will have another opportunity to comment, I'm assuming at city council, but not only that, if the city council wants to access uh, today's comments and the comments from the past, we can reference those days uh, or those um, sessions. Uh, so if city council wants to get more background and hear the, the speakers as they spoke previously, they can do that easily, right? Yes, all of that is on our website, on the cloud website. Okay, because I just want speakers to know that, you know, that they were not only heard today, but they will um, have the option of, of just uh, having their comments heard again by city council. But is it also true that they will be able to comment at city council? I believe that's true. I'll defer to Sandra. Yeah, so, you know, folks always have the opportunity um, to provide public comment at the beginning of every council meeting. And so if there is an item that's um, on the agenda or if there's an item that's in the public packet, uh, or even if it's not even um, a topic that's uh, on the agenda, they have the opportunity to provide public comment at the beginning of Okay, that's what I thought. Um, Allison, your thoughts? I agree with what's been said. I think that moving forward with the document um, is really important. I think we heard that from a lot of folks today that they're ready for this to to have the count the, the conversation with city council. Um, the only question, not the only question, but one question, I think 
to revisit is what Sandra brought up about a summary at the top. Is that something that staff, if folks are interested in that, is that the, something that staff would provide that background? Um, or is that something that members of the club, um, if it's desired to add that, members of the club would draft that? Do you want to answer that, um, city folks, or do you want me to? Um, staff is happy to provide any support that CLAB would like. Um, we're happy to draft the introduction, or if CLAB would prefer to do that, um, you know, it's completely up to the board, but we are more than happy to provide any level of support that you would like in getting this uh, memo finalized. So I'm just trying to make sure I did not, I'm not misspeaking when I say this. Uh, Kristen sent the original um, document before we started discussing all this to me and I, I've just been too busy. I haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, uh, but it would be short, you know, like a one paragraph sort of thing. And it would refer to the, you know, the original, um, um vote or uh, what is it called jonathan would know but i can't ask jonathan right now uh the original bill uh that started us off on this direction correct we have a memo that oh so, sorry kathy or Sandra, please go ahead i was just going to mention kathy's memo go ahead kristen um, we have a memo that Kathy Haddock, the original city attorney for CLAB, um, drafted earlier in this process. That is a great starting point for this. Um, we, we would likely need to make some updates to it, but um, that's the document that Tom was referring to. Sandra, please feel free to add anything. Um, yeah, no, the only thing I was going to add is just that, I mean, I think that in order to kind of keep it simple, I think, you know, staff could certainly um, provide the introduction and without making too many changes, I think that there is, um, well, for lack of a, a better word, a little bit of distrust. And I think that the less that staff messes with the memo, the better. And so I think our intention would be to just provide, just to tee it up for council so that they know what it is that they're looking at. So the, the less that we make changes, the better, I think from our perspective. And so it would really just be about teeing it up and just providing the background, why is it they're getting this? And then allowing them to just take in all the information that you all have provided. I've been, I've been trying to go through my email in the background here to try to find that, and I have not done it yet um, successfully. Uh, do we have that available for presentation, Caitlin, that we could, if we're not going to, well, I, I think we need to have a vote to approve, If it, I mean, it almost sounded unanimous um, to go with the document as is. Um, which means that we have time to work on the the prelude. Kate, do you want to? Um, you had asked Caitlin the question about if if the city has a copy of that. Um, yeah, but um, they'll answer that. Well, go ahead, Caitlin. Um, I'm sorry. A copy of which document? Um, if there was something we could use as a prelude to oh. our recommendations to city council. Tom, I had an opportunity to look at that and it really is outdated. I don't think that we should use that. Okay. Um, yeah, it's really outdated and it doesn't, I think it would create more complexity than we need to. So I, I actually think that the, the document that you have is just fine. It's just a matter of adding a couple of sentences at the beginning to tee it up. Okay. And if, if you know, if we've the staff has offered to do that, if if folks are not comfortable with that, then then you'll have to do that during this meeting because I think then you're out of time. 
Okay, and Kate, did you want to speak next or, or, I mean, the gist of the, what we were talking about in our preparatory meeting was a, um, a statement of what the bill in charge, you know, the state bill charged us with and what, why the CLAB is making these recommendations to city council. Go ahead, Kate. Um, yeah, I mean, whatever y'all have discussed sounds sounds fine for me. Um, I, I was just going to say that, you know, just even talking about like this document is a representation of the work that we've done over the last two years to talk about hospitality. Um, I think explaining why we set it up this way. So, you know, it captures kind of the story of our motions, the results and who voted for what. Um, I think because, again, we all had kind of a, a, an important, I think there was a lot of emphasis on wanting to make sure that each thing was captured and that each vote was captured. Um, so I think making sure that they know why are these things here? Why am I seeing all the pass and the fails? Why am I seeing who voted? Um, so maybe just like a, a short thing about, hey, we've been doing this for two years. We put a lot of effort in. We had a couple of public hearings. And then also about here's kind of the story of all of our motions. Here's who voted. Here's the past. And um, and then descriptions, you know, please see any descriptions about the individual things from, um, you know, the, the, the perspectives of each voter as they wanted to at the end of the document. Okay. Robin. I like that. I think that makes a lot of sense. I do want to just look back for one second on, you know, we've had these public hearings intentionally two of them where people had a chance to come and speak and i really appreciate everyone who had comments to add today and i think that it, there's a little bit missing when we're not talking about what we heard through the public comment i mean you know i know bia campbell said in her remarks you know your first um public hearing we had a majority of people who came to spoke to speak in support and I have really copious notes from that meeting. There were 17 people who spoke in support and 16 people who spoke in opposition. But of the 17, almost everybody but one was had a business interest. And I think there's something, I think there's something important in saying who came to speak and what their um, who they were representing, because we have and in today's hearing we saw everyone who spoke in support has a business interest and that's not good or bad it just is so you know i don't know if the board is interested in capturing some of that for this particular memo maybe it doesn't matter people have an opportunity to speak later but um i do think it's i do think it's you know relevant I, I um, actually remember that vote, <laughs> or I remember that tabulation um, without having to refer to any notes, uh, 16 to 17. I think it's safe to say that the public speakers that commented are, uh, it's pretty divided almost right down the middle if you, you know, add tabulate today's and then add the tabulations from the past one. It's, pretty divided right down the middle. Yeah, and, and, and then you had a sort of diversity of interests that were that came forward that I thought were kind of relevant as well. I mean, you had people talking about um, the age limitation, you know, and you had people talking about uh, health concerns around secondhand smoke and impaired driving and edibles versus drinkables versus, you know, and I don't know that that's relevant or that we could capture that in some way that um, would be helpful to the council, but I do think who came and who did they represent is relevant. Uh, thank you. Any other comments along that line, or is someone ready to make a motion to approve the document? Brian? I just want to get uh, Sandra's input on like what is the appropriate way to frame a motion or is it simply as simple as uh, a motion that this document and their reading packet be uh, sent to city council for their consideration 
Oh yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, I think it's probably just as simple as that. If there are any deviations from the way that it looks now, then I would include that in the motion. Otherwise, it's going to go exactly the way it looks right now. So if there's something that you want different or addressed, I would add that to your motion. Allison? Just to that point um, about how it looks right now, there were some um, changes and edits in the Google Doc version of the document. So if people are, if you're approving what's in the Google document or if you're approving what's in the the reading packet, because they're technically, they, they read differently in this moment. It sounds like people are all talking about the Google Doc, but just wanted to make sure before we move forward with the motion. I don't have the Google document up in front of me. What What's a, a um, notable difference? Just some additional comments from folks clarifying their there's just some additional edits. I don't think it's anything substantive that has to do with this top part, but just people adding to their perspectives in the second section of the of the memo. Well, I would add okay, then I think that Google Doc should be the binding one if that's where people have the most up to date versions. Yeah, I I agree with that. Anybody? Is there any reason somebody would be opposed to that using the latest version? And then we'd, we would add a preamble, a short preamble of some kind. And then also maybe at the end have references for which meeting, maybe even just give them the, um, the URL for the meeting audio for the two uh, public comment meetings. In the preamble, you could just say what, what the dates were for the two public hearings as part of the explanation of the past two years. And so then they could reference that it's pretty straightforward. Okay. You ready to make a motion, Brian? <laughs> um, You're the classic motion maker, I'm sorry. Everyone makes excellent motions, and I apologize that I'm violating our own uh, intent to have these motions written down ahead of time. But I would motion that the current version of the Google document that contains the motions, voting history, and members' arguments for motions be sent to City Council for their consideration, subject to any changes and preambles that city staff will add. And you want to take out motion three in the process? Oh, is this is another edit that we're making. That would be my friendly amendment, Brian, would be removing motion three and then combining or putting one right after the other. Um, the motions about hours of operation. The 14 and 22. Yeah. Can we just make those changes directly in the documents since that's what we're referencing now? Does anyone oppose that doing the making those changes? So we're going to change the numbering of everything in two, by the way. So just procedurally, let me withdraw my motion since it sounds like there's still edits to be made. So I'd say, let's make these edits to the document and then I'll make the motion again for the have the stable document. Is that fair? Okay. So I withdraw my motion. We're gonna make some edits and then I will reintroduce my motion. Oh, we're gonna change the numbering. That's a third change now. <laughs> um, oh, sure. okay. you're, you're in the Google, I, I guess I should get into the Google document. Um, I think Brian, he's saying if we remove three, then we'll have to renumber everything. But if we group 14 with 22, 40, then that'll change the numbering of those. And then I, could, I guess I would ask Evan how he feels about keeping the withdrawn motion. Yeah. 
or anyone who wants to comment on that. I don't think that we keep withdrawn motions. I right. can't hear you, sorry. I think that would be confusing to include withdrawn motions. Okay. And um, yeah, on the numbering thing, yeah, I think we don't have to renumber them. We can just delete three. Um, you can make a note if you wanted to, but. I'm looking for Evan in the list here. Is he still? I don't believe member Anderson is still on the meeting. He's still on. I don't believe he is, no. Oh, okay. I mean, ideally it would be best to have it come from him, but. So I've made two changes to the document. I have from the table, I've removed motion three. I've also removed the proposed motion section at the end. So those are two changes I've made now. Okay. And then instead of um, moving 14 and 22, you could just write in 14 that um, it was was revisited um, or overruled by 22, however we want to say that. And what about the red text? You can make that black. That was just a, that was in red previously because that was what was in, in question. And that's why it was revisited, but I don't think that's originally, but there was added stuff on there. And if, um, never mind. And it's in red in two places. And I agree with you, Kate. I think it doesn't add anything to have the red there. Where else is red? I think, I think in the comments red. section. Oh. On page 18 at the bottom. Thank you. I just, I just it. changed it. Yep, I changed it. Okay, so to review, we have changed the font color. We added a note under uh, motion 14, indicating that the substance of this motion is revisited in motion 22. We've removed motion three. We've removed the suggested motions that weren't uh, voted on. There's um, also some, some support and oppose um, bullets in this that don't have any responses. Can I, is everybody okay with me deleting those? I would say that the members of the board have had an opportunity to leave the comments, but they weren't required to leave any. So I would say we can remove ones that are empty. Cool. And if people still wanted to do past versus failed, you could just bold all the past ones and not bold the failed ones. All right, say that again. I didn't hear that. Okay. If people are still interested in, in making a difference between the, the past versus failed, you could fold the entire row for all of the ones that have passed, and you could keep the ones that have failed as regular text. The entire row. Oh, like yeah, that. so the yeah. date. Yeah, just mm -hmm. oh, I can show okay. you. Well, whoever's, oh, wait, I'm looking at, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would look like that. The whole thing. Whoa. Okay. I, don't, I was just going to suggest the word pass, but. Kind of like the way you were doing it, Tom, where it was just the word passed, because again, there is some substance in these failed motions that I think the council, we don't want to give them an indication that these, they shouldn't be looking at some of this stuff. I mean, and that's for a pro or opposed standpoint, for instance, on, you know, a couple of these things like the concentrates question. I mean. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Any other, I mean, besides adding references to the URLs for the meeting 
audios and more importantly, the preamble. So what about the ask? Do you do you all want there to be an ask of council? I mean, I would think the next logical step is to add this to the work plan for council, but I I don't want to put words into people's mouths. What is um, elaborate what you mean by that? What do you want council to do with this information? Yeah. Well, we are just an advisory body. So we're asking them to review our recommendations and come up with the city recommendations. I guess my question to council would be, um, what would a workflow be like, or, or is this a normal workflow where we submit some sort of recommendation to city council and they and their staff then would come up with the ordinance or would, or is it still in our capacity that we should be recommending an ordinance to city council? Well, you can take whatever approach that you would like. I would, I mean, if you wanted it to be added to the work plan, then the work would have to be scoped um, by staff. And, you know, staff would need to determine when they would have capacity for the ordinance changes to come forward. Many or some of these items will have to go through um, the planning department and planning board if it has to do with zoning and those sorts of things. So there's quite a lot of work that would need to be scoped out. But if you if you wanted council to do that, then you would have to ask them to do that. Or you could ask for an opportunity to have a discussion with council about it to, to kind of take their temperature to see if this is something that they would be interested in bringing forward. Um, so there's a couple of different approaches. Does that answer your question? So I think then a motion would be that uh, the board recommends that these recommendations be added to the council's work plan. Is that an appropriate recommendation? It's appropriate if the board agrees to that. But Checking I do think that it, adding it to the work plan doesn't necessarily mean that you're bringing forward an ordinance. It could be that you are inviting more discussion with council about it, or it could be more. But I think just getting it on somebody's radar would be the next logical step. And that part of that is putting it on a work plan. All right. And I agree that a work plan should be part of the motion that we make. So let me One take quick a clarifying question, Sandra. Sorry, Chair, do you mind? No, no, yeah, and then I have something to mention, but. Okay, thank you. Sandra, so the, the a board like ours makes a request that our recommendations go on the council's work plan. Then does that automatically mean they're part of the work plan or is would council consider that? And then do they vote to decide what goes on their work plan? Or can you just elaborate on that a little bit more? So council would be involved in this decision on whether it becomes part of the work plan or not. They typically make decisions on what is put on the work plan at um, their annual retreat, which happens at the beginning of the year. And so, um, you know, they've already established their work plan for 2023. So when they got together again for their next retreat, um, presumably in January 2024, then um, you know, they've been collecting items throughout the year and that would be discussed during the retreat and they would either provide, you know, they would provide staff with direction on whether or not that should be included on the work plan or not. 
so let me mention um, at this point that in the past month, I applied for and interviewed for continuing on the board. Uh, in my interview, Rachel Friend was the city council representative and, and Sandra and Caitlin and Kristen are well familiar with this. And Brian is, has been read in also. Uh, when Rachel asked me, um, I can't, I wish I could remember exactly what, but the, she asked if I had any questions for city council. And one of the things I asked is whether city council would like to have uh, an informal uh, like introduction to what we've been discussing for the past two years. And, um, and then there's been a couple emails back and forth that Rachel suggested um, that it might be helpful to for city council to have a study session. And she used the analogy to when city council decided to allow electric scooters in town. Some of the city council people did not know much about electric scooters. And so they had a study session just to find out more information. And she, she, yeah, she suggested that, that potentially that would work well for the hospitality discussion also. Now, you all know the rules that, you know, it's a public meeting if you have more than two members of any body present. Um, so she, at that point in time, when she threw it out, she suggested one or two club members presenting just kind of like a study session to city council. So that's another thing. Now, I'm in a difficult spot in the sense that I don't know if I'm going to be on the board, you know, come next month. Uh, so I don't know whether I'm the right person and some people might you know, have their own opinion as to who should be the two people, one or two people to present the information so far to city council, to, just to get them thinking about this, because some of them are not thinking about it, or, you know, have very little knowledge about it at all at this point in time. Sandra? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, so <clears throat> may I make a suggestion? Um, you know, the, the format that um, council hears this information is, um, probably going to go more like, you know, that you all are sharing this information with council. It'll be included as part of a, a, a council meeting packet. And um, then, you know, council members have an opportunity to ask questions about the packet. If there's interest in, um, in doing a study session, um, that interest would have to come from, um, a majority of council members, um, they could uh, set aside some time to talk about it in terms of whether or not they would actually have a study session. But again, it needs to be added to the work plan um, in order for it to move forward. And so um, that's why I'm recommending that ask in the memo so that they can make that happen. So um, yeah, I don't know if that helps or not. I, I've never seen, and that doesn't mean anything, but I, I don't I don't think I've seen from a procedural perspective, um, members of a board come do a presentation to council when they, they haven't been teed up on the agenda. I agree, and I just wanted to be completely transparent with respect to the discussions going on behind the scenes. Brian, you. I was just going to suggest that we move. I would like to make the motion, or someone else is welcome to make the motion. And I think uh, some of the issues that Tom is just describing about how city council is right into this, um, or if there's a study group, I mean, I think a lot of that would have to come from council itself, that it's, we're getting ahead of ourselves in terms of trying to plan for that as well. So, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't suggest that at this point. I mean, as Sandra correctly summarized, that 
that request would need to come from city council. So I think according to Sandra's verbiage, the part of your motion or someone's motion would be to have this put onto the, what was the correct term? Onto their work plan. But Alana? Yeah, I just have a motion. May I read it? Yeah. Um, I move to send the recommendations with the staff intro to city council to be advanced into ordinance for implementation, prioritizing this in councils, city councils and staff work plans. Using the most recent version of the Google document. Yeah, and in my motion, I cited also with the staff intro. Okay. So anyone have, well, is there a second on that? Brian seconds Alana's motion. And further discussion? Sandra did, is the verbiage correct? having trouble finding my mute button. <laughs> um, I'll read it one more time, Alana. <laughs> read it slow. Sure. Motion to send the recommendations with staff intro to city council to be advanced into ordinance for implementation, prioritizing this within city council and city staff work plans. Okay. Do you have any questions about that, Sandra? No, I said it was perfect. Oh, sorry, I didn't. You're, you're. I didn't hear you. I, I heard you say something, but I didn't hear what you said. Okay. Just, I have a question. Does that mean that the writing of a draft ordinance would happen prior to this going on to the council's work plan? Okay. Nope. Okay. Any further discussion? Oh, yeah. So there was, I, I'm sorry, I just noticed um, another city of Boulder person, Joel Wagner. I don't know Joel. Um, I don't know Joel's role either. Uh, so do you want to introduce yourself real quickly? And whether you have any input, I don't know who you are. So sure. Good evening. Um, uh, this is uh, my name is Joel Wagner. I'm the deputy director of the finance department. So uh, just really here listening in and, and supporting staff and all the uh, capable work that Kristen and her team and, and Sandra do. So thanks for letting me listen in. It's a really fantastic presentation. Okay. Thank you. And Pam was on earlier, but I do not see her anymore. Um, and I think, I don't know, Kristen, do you need, do, I'm just allowing option for comment. Uh, Kristen, did you have any comment? I don't have any further comments. I think the um, next steps for staff are, are pretty clear at this point. So I, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Oh, I forgot. There's actually two Kristens. So on right now. Do you know that? Have you noticed that? We do have another Kristen on our team named uh, Kristen Teague. She's a licensing analyst. It looks like she is um, potentially on this call as well. Okay, Michael. Yeah, uh, Alana, can you please read back the language of your motion again? I'm sorry. I, I heard it. I just, there's some language in there that I just am questioning. Motion to send the recommendations with the staff intro to city council to be advanced into ordinance for implementation, prioritizing this in city councils and city staff work plans. Uh, 
Michael, can you, oh, go ahead. Yeah, um, Sandra, with the language in Alana's motion to be advanced into ordinance for further implementation, I think that's what you said, Alana, is that correct? Oh, there it is. That is on the screen. So, Sandra, the language that I'm just asking you about is the language to be advanced into ordinance for implementation. It, to me, it seems like what we're <clears throat> what we're telling city council is um, approve the, approve the, the the motions that have all passed. It seems to me like the intent of this next step or the motion to council putting forth this document should be something more along the lines of for your consideration for further discussion amongst council or something to that effect. Am I, or am I too down in the weeds with respect to the language? I, I think it's within this board's discretion on how they want to couch that. I think that first and foremost, it needs to be added to the work plan whether council wants to pursue it in an ordinance or not would probably be discussed in a study session. I would imagine that they would want to learn more about it before actually, um, you know, directing staff uh, to, to draft an ordinance, but um, it's really within this board's discretion on how that is uh, presented. Go ahead, Michael. And so, Alana, would you entertain a friendly amendment to your motion just to change that language that I questioned, just to say something for for implementation or for inclusion in, into council's uh, work plan or study session or something like that? Michael, the city council process is a process that I have confidence in, and um, they're going to do the process that they want to do on this set of recommendations. I want to honor the work that we've done by signaling the desired outcome, which is policy through ordinance. So the answer to my question is yes or no? I think that my language accomplishes what would honor all of the work we've done, everything that we're all looking for. It just also points to the fact that we're doing this for the means of eventual policy through ordinance. A study session is not an adequate response to the work that we've done. The desired outcome is policy. I'm not sure. I don't want to try to put words in Michael's mouth, but I'm wondering if the the gist of his concern is that we are an advisory board and we're making advisory recommendations for them to for their consideration. It, it does say recommendations. Um, I mean. Yeah. I mean, well, it, all, it also the, says the to be, this to is be the conversation advanced. part of the, it, the discussion. It also says to be advanced into ordinance, which would be city policy or city law. And that's the language that I'm questioning. Is there any more discussion on the motion? Um, it sounds like there's not. Um, Alana's not willing to change the, the motion. Um, it has been seconded. So is there more? conversations about the motion or Thank you, other Kate. friendly amendments. I guess, I guess I would just, I'm just wondering if there's a way to do this where it says something along the lines of um, motion to send the recommendations with the city staff intro to city council with the specific ask that the city council add this issue to their work plan. 
I like that language, but I would just add at the end in order to advance this into ordinance for implementation. What do you think, Robin? Yeah, I mean, part of me doesn't like that because it's prescriptive. And again, as an advisory board, we're asking them to look at it. I think it's prescriptive in that it's, you know, but I understand where you're coming from. And I, I probably could support that because I think the council will decide what the, I don't necessarily think that this is telling the council they have to do this. So. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think I, it's not the hill to die on today, so. I just wanna add in my experience, when you add something to city council and city staff work plans, it's gonna go through double what it's gone through in this experience on in Club. And as an advisory board, we do have the ability to work with the city attorney to advance um, policy into ordinance as we've done in the past. Um, this set of recommendations is just too comprehensive and far reaching for us to do that uh, exclusively with city with the city attorney. Um, so I just hear everybody saying that we're just an advisory board and that's true, but it's a policy advisory board and we actually do have the ability to advance our recommendations into policy without city council and we've done that we've done that here together with the city attorney's office providing us with red lines on our recommendations and then um, sending those through. Somebody's audio. So I just don't, you know, my desire is, yeah, I appreciate that your comments, Robin, and I just don't want to send something that just says, you know, that doesn't include the end goal of policy. I think um, the city council is going to do what the city council does. So in some ways, the verbiage doesn't really matter that much. I just want to make sure that I understood from Sandra that this doesn't prescribe to council that they've got to create an ordinance before they start to dig into anything. No, it will still be up to council to decide what they do. Um, it, this board doesn't have the authority to direct counsel. So um, it's, I think, I think that it's fine the way it is. Uh, you know, it, it, you could say uh, for consideration, you know, to be advanced into ordinance for implementation, but essentially council's going to do um, what and prioritize the work as they see fit. And so they're not going to take one action over the other based on this motion. Are there other discussion or are we ready for a vote? Oh, that's what I just said, except I was mute. <laughs> Oops. Okay, I think, Caitlin, we're ready for a vote. All right, member Christie. Yeah, I'll, I'll oppose the motion. Member Green. I wanna be sure I'm clear, but I believe I support the motion. Vice Chair Keegan. Support the motion. Chair Kunzman. I'll support the motion. Member Malone? I support. Member Noble? I support. And Member Anderson is absent. Okay. Um, so how about we take another short break? And we're, we're, we have the luxury of time. We might finish early. I think we'll finish early. Um, and uh, we'll come back in, I don't know, six minutes, seven minutes. How about seven minutes?
Seven minutes? All right, so that makes it 528. Thank you. All right, I want to congratulate city staff that you have successfully evaded giving me your cell phone number so I could try calling you uh, during the break to see how you would feel about throwing together a paragraph. And then I also left messages for several others of you, but oops, you'll get that message later, um, including you, Kate, because you're good at wordsmithing. But. Um, Anyways, because so now that we uh, have successfully passed um, the motion, we do have a little time. Uh, although I, as I said in the last voicemail that I left, God, I hate the idea of wordsmithing by committee, but we could. Because it's just a short paragraph. How long would it take? I mean, really. What do y'all think? I have the confidence in city staff to be able to <laughs> come up with their own message. The trouble with that is that we can't vote on it then, or we can't, it's not coming from us per se. I agree with you. I, I have 100% confidence in them. But it seems like it's something we should vote on. We could go on to some other things. And I mean, the previous motion did delegate that responsibility to city staff. I guess we could always take that up and vote on it again. But I guess I would wait for city staff to come back versus trying to reverse the motion we just passed, which instructed city staff to come up with that language. So which one of the city staff that I'm now looking at, because I can see you all on the same screen now, uh, who who would take that on? And how confident do you feel that that you've got that figured out? I'm sure we could probably figure it out between ourselves, Tom. Okay, all right. I just want to make sure. I don't want to saddle you with something that that you know one might be reluctant to do. So, okay, good. If it will help. Two, um, I will include, or I'm not going to be doing clap next month, but the person that's doing clap next month will include what we wrote in the packet for next month. So y'all can see it's, it won't just like blindly. Yeah. Yeah. To city council. Yeah. All right. I'm trying to find in one of my many windows today's agenda. There it is. I just found it. Uh, so next on the agenda officially is matters from senior council. And anything passed, I don't have anything today. Okay. Uh, regulatory licensing office. Can 
Caitlin, would you like to provide a quick update on board recruitment and then I'll talk about agenda items for future meetings? Sure. Um, yeah, so the update for board recruitment, and I apologize, everyone. Um, the applications for the board members who interviewed or are in your meeting packet. I just neglected to put them in your reading packet. So they are in your meeting packet if you wanted to see those. Um, those people, there was four of them were interviewed in February, mid-February. And then um, I believe that city council will be making the recommendations this week on who they will be appointing to the board. So um, you will, you can tune into that to see, we, they don't tell us ahead of time. So you can tune into that to see who they're appointing or um, we will let you know next month. Just one quick note. Um, so council will appoint board and commission members on um, the March 16th meeting. Not this week, but the week after. Thank you, Sandra. March 16th. Now, um, I'm seeing more than four. Did, I thought you, just for clarification, I think you told me four interviewed, is that correct? I did say that it might, was it five? It might've been five, I'm so sorry. Oh, okay, all right. I can talk. Did anyone have any questions about that? I just wanted to clarify that member Malone didn't reapply, so this might be her last meeting. Oh yeah, I was going to mention that once again. Oh, you were not here. We already took note of that, and we were going to have give her the last word. All right. So, um, and I apologize. It was five interviewed. Okay. Okay, uh, Kristen. Well, now that we are finished with our discussions around hospitality, we'd love to hear what the board would like to discuss at the April meeting. We do have a list, an ongoing list of suggestions for future club meetings that we've been collecting um, ideas from members over the past few months. So happy to share that, um, but we'd love some direction from the board on what you would like to discuss in the April meeting so we can prepare the packet for you. Is that in our um, packet, either one of the packets? Um, Caitlin, would you mind sharing that document on your screen? Yep, just give me one minute because I believe it is in your packet as well. So I just want to give you the page number. So page. 60 is in your packet, and then I'll share it on my screen. This is just. Did you say six zero? Your audio went out again. Six zero. So th these are the discussion topics that we've heard from different um, members so far, and we're happy to add to this or, um, you know, re reorganize the order, or whatever you'd like to see. Who, uh, go ahead. Kate. I'll recognize oh. Kate for it. Okay. Um, I was just gonna mention that Sorry, I, I, I don't see the the licensing um, kind of portion of the collab on here. I know that's something that we had talked about before, um, but um, that was just one thing that I noticed that wasn't on here, but I'll let the board decide kind of what's next, but um, just wanted to mention that. 
thank you, Kate. We'll definitely um, add that on there because that's an important um, discussion to have is when Cloud would like to transition to a more quasi-judicial role and what you would like that to look like. Okay, Robin. Thank you. Um, is there a possibility that we'll be meeting uh, a new board member as soon as next month or possibly two, I think, new board members as soon as next month and yeah. could our agenda be you know a discussion of a um, little bit of orientation for those new members and also a broader conversation about what we hope to cover next in other words if it's going to be a bit of a reset we're transitioning out of this conversation on um, social consumption moving into a new direction I almost feel like an intentional meeting that really looked at those things and people could, you know, I know we've all been looking at this document and working on that and, uh, you know, I'd like a little more time to prepare in April for some of the things I'd like to see CLAP do next. So we had this discussion before everyone came on at three o'clock or right around three o'clock that new members will be starting presumably next month. Now, how will they be trained? Sandra, Kristen, Caitlin, Rewa. Staff does have some training materials for new board members. Um, some informational packets will be meeting with the new members one-on-one -on -one and um, providing some training prior to their first meeting. Uh, we also always encourage new members to connect with current members, so they may be reaching out to you all individually um, to connect before the next meeting. And let me augment that. Um, Alana, would you be okay communicating with, uh, I mean, you, you've offered to speak, so would you be okay with uh, giving your insight to new folks? Yeah, sure. You mean the new members? Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, I'm not, not going far um, and plan to continue to you know, support the, the board um, from my new role as a community member constituent. Okay. Brian? And then I'll come back to you, Alana. Right. I wanted to echo Kate's uh, suggestion that uh, um, the training support will need to sort of take up licensing in our quasi-judicial authority at some point. Um, my second contribution would be to hear from the industry as we exit uh, emergency declarations related to COVID, uh, if there are policy calibrations or input um, that needs to happen. Uh, third, Member Noble has continued to emphasize, and I share her concern around youth consumption, which is captured here, uh, but continue to make sure that uh, we are engaging with county and city um, programs around youth intervention and prevention. I had a fourth one, but it will come to me later. I'm not nearly as prepared as Alana with writing things down. Alana? Or did, any, did anyone, even including city staff, have any questions about what Brian just suggested? Okay, Alana. Um, yeah, I, I think as I uh, raised at our retreat and I think at a recent meeting as well, I think using a, a meeting every now and again for education is, is gonna be worthwhile. Um, in my time on the board, um, I, I didn't really push for, um, you know, industry-based concentrate education as as well as I probably should have, and and I, especially in just hearing some of the comments tonight, um, like you know, there's no upside for our community. Um, it just gives me the sense that there's maybe a lack of awareness, um, a potential lack of awareness surrounding the adult use, um, kind of the the forms, methods, reasons behind it, um, you know, why the cannabis industry, the market and products have gained such acceptance among 
adult consumers. Um, and I just want to echo my support for an availability. Um, it doesn't have to be me. It could be, you know, a staff member um, for taking, giving, providing the opportunity to just do a one-on-one on either all products, form factors, and their consumption methods, or uh, concentrate specifically, because that's obviously been a hot topic. Um, there's a lot, lot, lot to understand about what drives, um, you know, consumption behaviors. And it's certainly changed a lot over the last decade and two decades. Um, so I just want to echo my support for that educational session. Um, and of course, um, the other ones like the one that Robin has raised. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that. Did anyone have any suggestions for someone to address the, the issue of social equity? I think it would depend on this particular aspect that we're looking into. Like, are we looking at the regulatory framework for social equity or, um, you know, the opportunities there? There's There are some organizations that are set up to su support um, social equity in the industry. They might be a good resource. I think Native Roots is, is um, comes to mind as I think they're connected with. Um, as you've heard, a lot of the retailers are connected with the social equity. Any other suggestions? What about also I, on the same vein, any suggestions for impairment experts? Stacy. I think it would be great to hear from Cinnamon um updates on where their research is at as far as uh use experts i would suspect that would be a top-notch person to hear from um also really helpful probably for new members to hear stuff like that as well as address some of the issues on the list already um so i think she could be interesting and as far as social equity, um, Jonathan Singer has come to speak multiple times at our meetings and, you know, from what he describes of his background, he might be an interesting person to hear more from on that topic. Um, those were my first thoughts. I feel pretty committed to hearing more about uh, different educational programs for like a public health kind of sense. Um, in addition to, like we've already said, the youth focus, uh, that research that I had put the summary into this meeting packet or sent it to uh, everyone. I think it Stacey, is the, Stacey, yeah. one sec. your audio, it, it's it's seventy percent there or somewhere. It, okay. Yeah, you're, 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 we're not hearing so that packet or that information that I sent out. Uh, with this month's reading packet, I thought just really highlighted that we do need more public health education focus in all manners uh, related to cannabis. So somehow getting more speakers in that realm or more um, information in that area too feels important. Uh, the youth focus is just kind of part of that to me. Okay, and I would just suggest that Cinnamon's not the only uh, professor. They have a new person, although I someone from the labs from Change Lab. I mean, it doesn't have to be her, but yeah. somebody who could represent that research and what they're doing, what they're looking at, what sets them apart, and why it's more unique per se than some of the other research out there. Uh, I think that's useful for all of us. Plus certainly a new board member if they weren't as informed. Yeah, and uh, so just whoever's making notes, is that uh, you, Caitlin? I'm making notes, Tom. Oh, you are, Kristen, sorry. So Cinnamon Bidwell, 
and but as you change uh, Stacey, I mean, we could be the, like more broad it doesn't have to be her like i said i'm well, sure she might is. she could be the contact person and she would be i mean she's great and perfectly yeah. fine but yeah exactly she could she could suggest somebody from it's called the chain that's it's an acronym c-h-a-n-g-e change lab Are you asking me or just saying that? No, I'm just telling You're uh, saying that you're Kristen. recording. Yeah. Uh, Brian? Yeah, I think one more speaker could be uh, Tristan Watkins. He's the uh, program manager for the Cannabis Business Office and the uh, Governor's Office. And uh, he's been spearheading a lot of social equity issues uh, and initiatives as well. I think he's, he came to the office about a year or two ago now. Um, the fourth point that I just remembered would be, I think, building on member Malone's kind of point that um, what is sort of new innovations or sort of new developments uh, with different kinds of cannabis technologies, I guess, for like a lack of a better term, in terms of uh, we, during the discussion about edibles, I think the issue of like fast acting kind of came up, but I would sort of be interested in like always hearing, checking in once a year or something like that around like just what are the latest and greatest uh, and how that might impact the policy we consider uh, recommending to the city. Is it just me or are several people's audios going in and out? I'm not having any issues. Oh, okay, all right. Maybe it's just, maybe it's my Wi-Fi. I don't know, Robin? On, oh, sorry, I, I'll raise my hand, but I was just going to tag something onto Brian's comment about the edible education. It would be interesting to hear more than one speaker on that, because it does appear like there's a lot of competing viewpoints on the same thing, which is interesting. And so it, maybe we could find a couple people to come and talk to us about that. Uh, Robin? Um, another topic that I think the CLAP has a lot of indicators that would be good for us to dig in is to, is around impaired driving and not just what's happening out there. We heard some kind of disturbing statistics today from one of the people who spoke, but, you know, it's come up over and over and over again, starting from the standard that you where you measure um, somebody's level of intoxication is just scientifically invalid. Um, the whole roadside thing, you know, what's happening if, if these numbers are getting worse, is there something our board could do to dig into this to understand it and maybe suggest that, you know, certain new co technologies come to the forefront, that sort of thing. And also, Evan really just uh, expressed a lot of um, just nervousness around having this responsibility for knowing when people are intoxicated or not intoxicated. And it just seems like a really tricky question. I think it would be worth a conversation um, to try to see if we could develop some recommendations. Um, I don't know whether that's to law enforcement. I mean, I read about um, a law enforcement training standard that um, it's a really high standard for, uh, it's it goes above and beyond what sort of a basic roadside is. and. Um, the MAD groups are recommending, because of all these difficulties in determining if somebody's intoxicated, because again, you get people caught up who aren't intoxicated, they've used earlier, or they have a higher tolerance level, or what have you. So it, it really runs both ways, but it's problematic. And um, there's a police officer training thing that gives people a, a much better um, tool set to evaluate people at the roadside. Maybe there would be a way to recommend for that or to try to get money to support officer training, a certain number of officers. So I think that could be a good agenda topic to look at. Look at. We probably need a little prep time to pull um, those speakers together. I'd be glad to work on that if that's something the board's interested in. Okay, Stacy. I was just interested, like on this topic Robin's bringing up in the report, 
uh, in our packet that I added on you know the research, it was interesting to see the drop in youth driving under the influence or reported drop, I should say. Uh, I have my thoughts on that, but it was also interesting that among adults, the driving or the percentage of adult consumers who say they drive after using has been pretty stable under 20% said, I think, 17 and a half. So I, I think that was really interesting too. And so it just kind of brings to the question is like that the best focus, I guess, is what I said here and think to myself, is that really where we want to focus our time, given that we don't have technology yet the way we would want to, to support officers at the roadside? And I remember a speaker even saying that, I, I think he was an uh, officer who came to speak with us, who said, it, you know, that's the problem that they face is they don't have that technology right now. And a lot of it ends up just being, you know, um, qualitative, which we need to do, be, you know, be able to do better, but we don't have it. So I guess, I, I would wonder if that was the best use of our time and focus if we have a limited amount, just given the amount that's unknown on this and what appears to be a somewhat significant but stable amount of users driving, um, adults, I should say. And then beyond that, I think, like you said, Robin, there is this massive effect of daily users of cannabis versus new users. And so when we're considering hospitality, that to me at least comes into my mind, like some of these people aren't the daily users, they're the new users. But then there's this other group that we've seen in research that use heavily and regularly. And although maybe they would test positive past the threshold, their driving seems less impaired. And so it's just I guess there, it's just this really confounded area for me, like thinking about it. And I'm not sure what our goals would be as a board on that, you know, just because it feels intangible at this point to me with no technology, et cetera. Um, I think there's a lot we can do to focus on stuff that we see is a problem and we know is a problem and to learn more about it. So I kind of, I kind of not really support the idea of like going down the path of like, you know, trying to figure out roadside training for officers. And I, I'm not sure that feels like the best use of our time at this point. Maybe we could, okay, I hear you. Maybe what we could do would be to have somebody from this MAD group come in and because they've really thought about this and they've thought about why this is really, really hard. And again, they've come up with one possible solution. Maybe they could come in and talk with us about that explain what it might cost to get people trained on this new and higher standard and you know that because what we have seen is you know and it's hard to draw it exactly to these different use statistics but colorado right now has a huge problem with dry, uh, impaired driving fatalities so i do think it's worthwhile to dig in and I, to your point, Stacy, maybe a focused presentation from a group like MAD on this particular new standard would be worthwhile. Yeah, I, I guess I support what you're saying. Like, absolutely, it's horrific what's happening statistically with those numbers. But I suspect we're trying to pin it on something that maybe is the wrong, you know, suspect. It's the usual suspect. I, one of the speakers today even said, you know, cannabis tends to get a pretty bad rap. And based on what I'm seeing in the latest research from CDPHE, it's like, maybe that's true, right? Like we would expect to see much higher rates of adults driving under the influence of cannabis to pair well and blame it with, you know, or blame it for what we're seeing in these, you know, uh, driving fatalities under the influence. Yeah, I mean, maybe the conversation is we don't assign blame or decide that this is, but I do think you have to attack, it's a multi-pronged problem. Yeah. And if we're, you know, moving into ways of expanding commercial cannabis, it's really would be responsible for us to think about consequences and how to mitigate for those. Yeah, I think absolutely. And finding education, like in my mind, especially if we're talking about these hospitality places, like I was saying before, the you know idea of having new visiting users, that kind of thing to me feels like a great opportunity to have more educational programs, you know, and it, that's at least where I would throw my support is like more education. 
as opposed to trade, you know, putting money into training officers on a system that's, you know, at this point, we don't have any reason to support because we don't know if it shows up in data later. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just feel like public health education is massive, especially with something new like cannabis or relatively new like cannabis or new as, as we consider all these new things that we're adding, like hospitality establishments. Okay, Allison. I agree that I think depending on where city council goes with hospitality, I think there's a lot of opportunity to continue to make recommendations and to um, keep an eye on how things are going. Um, but I think that depends on what happens at city council. So if they're, and, and when that happens, we heard from um, Sandra tonight that that might not be a, a short timeline. Um, so I think yes, but putting a pin in that until there's a more clear timeline. Um, and also going back to what folks were saying about there may be some new people that we really focused on hospitality that a lot of things on this list would be really interesting and great to learn, but it might be helpful when we have new folks to spend some time thinking about what what's the goal, like what is the next thing to provide input on? Um, and is that impaired driving recommendations? Is that, um, you know, other, other sort of learning about social equity and making recommendations there? I think we had a really clear charge around hospitality from council and from the community. And I think it, it might be helpful to think about what are we trying to do? What are the next couple goals to then focus some of this list? Um, I think everything on this list would be amazing to learn about and I think really interesting, um, but it might be important to take a step back um, before deciding on any of these in isolation and think about what is it in service to. Somehow we'll have to decide on what we're gonna, what, what the board is going to talk about next week though, or next month, excuse me. I agree, with, I hear what you're saying and I agree with you. So you might wanna pick a couple that seem most pressing. Um, anyone else? I would uh, mention that Tristan is with the can. It's 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 appointed by the governor, but it's called the Cannabis Business Office. And and if people did not see the recent uh, press release, uh, Jared Polis tweeted about. Um, well, where did it go here? Uh, having cannabis available in vending machines. I don't know if everybody saw that. I'm curious if everyone would agree with maybe taking up the question on all angles of concentrates as one of our major next issues. And are you speaking in support of that or? Yeah, I would support that because it feels like today's speakers, you know, just as far as our hospitality questions were concerned, there was a lot of questions around our decisions or recommendations on concentrates. Likewise, I know a lot of, sorry if there's groaning, that's my dog, um, but there's also a lot of us, I think, who don't feel very sure one way or another, and I know some of us in our meeting together in person said it would be great to have a little more information. Alana has offered already to help with at least one side of that, and like all things, I always like to hear multiple opinions. And I think maybe we could spread it out over a couple of meetings where we have people speak to us about concentrates, um, you know, for or against the research to support those things. Uh, I think it's always changing. I think we heard today also about something that is a really good point that there's a lot of new products that meet the market regularly and, you know, fast acting this or that. And so I think you know, under that umbrella, it would be useful to learn more about that if we're, you know, making recommendations and sending on things like that to council. I think it's important that all board members have at least a base level of education on those topics. And I'm not sure we all do. I'd say I'd love to hear that stuff and just to bring me up to speed. And that's something I already do know a little about, right? So 
I, I would support pushing that to the front of our list of like, what do we talk about next time? Anyone else want to advocate for another topic or two to push to the forefront? I think, um, by the way, just to mention, I think Michael is no longer, Michael and Evan are both not with us, right? And yeah. as I remember, Mike, Michael said he had to dip out at six, right. if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah, I'm just trying to notice who's still in the room versus not. In the room. Um, I'm wondering, I think this was mentioned last time, there's a discussion topic number one, two, three, four, five. Is it, doesn't it go against the ordinance or against uh, some rules? I mean, that's not something we can control. Is that correct, Sandra? It's um, established through charter and it would have to go to a vote of the people in order to change that. So currently um, you have to live within the city in order to serve on a, um, a city board. So it may not be f a fruitful discussion. Well, it may or may not be. I mean, if, if the board feels strongly about it, they, you know, yeah, they could push the idea of, of bringing forward something on um, the ballot, but I think that it would be odd for it to come from a board. It usually would be a, more of a citizen initiative that it would come from, or sometimes it is something that's been that's brought forward by council. So if council were pers to be persuaded that it's something that's worthwhile, to bring forward, they would make the decision on whether or not to put it on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess in the same vein as what Stacy recommended, I, I don't know Tristan Wat Watkins, and I notice that there's other people. Um, there's a staff of four in the cannabis business office. It looks like maybe Tristan's the best person. Um, and Brian, you might know that better than I do, but it, it would be interesting to hear. Um, what? Oh, that's, Michael, you're <laughs> Michael's back, but there we go. Um, to to hear from someone close to the governor, what's like, what's coming down the pike, I guess. if that person would be willing to speak to that. Just building on that, Tom, I think that when the legislative session closes, um, there might be other things happening at the state level that's worth us starting to digest as well for the city of Boulder. Um, so maybe in May or June, um, just putting that on a regular roadmap of our board, just considering anything that came through the legislative session, mm -hmm. um, certainly, Legislation related to Prop 122 is currently being considered, and I think that our relationship of our board with uh, what happens in the Prop 122 natural medicine space is uh, a relationship or a conversation I continue to be interested in having. Okay, that makes sense. To piggyback on that, there's also the Marijuana Enforcement Division that has typical, you know, annual. Um, work groups and things like that with rules coming out. Um, so if we want to, um, not just the legislature, but also the rulemaking from uh, the Marijuana Enforcement Division, but just to keep that on our roadmap as well. Either Allison or anyone, do you think there's any recent update that Elizabeth Crow would want to include us in on? I know there's still the C program still exists and 
it is failing me if there was a new round of funding since she last talked to us. There's, I, and I believe they do produce an annual report um, that folks could look at and see if there were specific questions. I'm not sure I'm seeing it on this list, but wasn't there something that we were waiting for a study to be finished or some data to be finished gathering? That's or? the uh, CU Scientific Review Council um, at the Colorado awesome. School of Public Health. They just had a recent meeting and they are expecting to complete their you know, report, I believe they said, in the next couple of months. So they're still working on it. Okay, so not for next month. I do agree that when that's available, that would be great to have that update for the board. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna add it to the list. Will you um, tell me what it's called again? Um, it's right there at your very top where you've got under speakers, the Scientific speakers. Review Council of the Colorado School of Public Health. Perfect. That's That's the group. Okay. It's already there. Great. Well, I would bet that I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone from the change lab, either Cinnamon or someone she appoints, would be ready and willing to give some kind of update on what they've all been working on. That's separate from the uh, Review Council, you realize that, right? Yes, yes, I'm jumping. I'm just trying to come up with ideas for maybe at least two things for next month's meeting. We, have we narrowed it down to two things? No, but I've only heard one concrete suggestion so far. And that was to hear more about concentrates, to hear as recommended by Stacy. I mean, you heard, that's what you heard. What, what I heard was um, that we want to have, you know, a minute to talk to new members. And then that's also, true. yeah, people yeah. had asked several times to understand, better understand what this um, quasi-judicial thing might be and, you know, to get a presentation on that, so. Okay, so I'm up to three. Is that, where is that on the list? Oh, there it is, okay, all right. Can we put an asterisk or something after the three that have been, so those two are right next to each other? Sorry, one. <laughs> the mouse is going where it wants to go. Okay. Yeah, this one was mentioned. Yeah, transition. This one was mentioned. And this one was mentioned for next month is from what I heard, from what I understood. Okay, is that a full enough agenda or do you want to add one more? I don't I was just say I don't I don't think adding something just for the sake of adding it is <laughs> oh absolutely. is a good way to go. I think if there's something pressing that folks want to hear about, um, that would be a good use of the board's time and of staff's time. Great. But if we've got a few things that will be in service to the board and in service to the city, then I think we just stick with a few. Um, I do imagine that the transition to quasi-judicial role is a probably a meeting in itself. Um and may require more prep than just a few weeks before the next meeting, but that is just a guess on my part. Well, I'm also guessing it'll take more than one session. So the next one might be an intro. Kate, you were going to say something earlier? No, it's just that I second what Allison just said. Okay. Okay. 
anyone else have any further comments on topics for next meeting or meetings, but more specifically, the next meeting first. One more comment or question. Um, because we're having new or possibly a new board member for sure, but possibly new board members, is there, when do we do an election or are we set for a certain time period or could somebody remind me? I think it kind of depends on who's here next month. And then I think we should have another election even if I am still here. Yeah, I mean, are we supposed to do it every, do you know if there's, if it's meant to be done once a year or is there any guidance on that? I'd have to look at the rules of procedure. I don't know if anyone knows off the top of their head. I, I wasn't around when you guys created those. Um, um, I can try and, and look for it while we're, we're discussing it here. And could you get back to you? Um, but I also, I, I guess I just want to check in um, with staff and just make sure that they're okay with the topics that have been selected um, since it, I mean, there's not a whole lot of time to prepare in advance. Um, but um, I, and I guess it all depends on how deep you want to get into quasi-judicial because as someone already mentioned, that could be a whole meeting in itself. Um, so if we could get a little bit more direction in that regard, that would be helpful. I think in previous discussions, we had talked about what our options are in terms of where we draw the line with um, the quasi-judicial, like whether it's, you know, just certain applications or all applications, and if it's, um, you know, violations or not violations, if it's, um, so I think um, when we talked before, Michonne and, and Kathy had talked about, or Michonne had talked about it being maybe like a, a half hour to 45 minutes, just an intro of what kind of the structure is, and then, um, what some of the rules are um, and just kind of like an intro um, and then what our option, you know, like have a discussion about the options and what, what, it, what would it would look like. Um, and then we had talked previously about potentially like having somebody from um, the, 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 um, the liquor board come and speak um, at some point to just give us an idea of what things they did and like how, um, and then we had also talked about like listening in on one, but anyways, those were, other conversations, but that's that's what I remember from previous conversations about the first steps um, of this process. Thanks, Kate. Any other guidance for staff on that issue? Okay. Um, Trying to pull up so do I don't think we have to as I remember well first of all the thing that you're trying to look up Sandra I don't think we had any particular rules on in terms of how often a chair has to, or should be voted on or a vice chair do you remember anything Brian no, I don't. Yeah. And then do we need to vote on the, the list of three things? I think we'll take that up at our planning meeting next month. Okay. Sandra? Yeah, that's fine. You don't need to vote. Okay. Sounds like you have consensus anyway. Yeah, sounded like it. All right. I'm trying. And then in terms of um, just in terms of transitions that y'all are talking about, I mean, I, I would think that as a new member, I would need a little bit of time to get my bearings before um, a revote, but I don't know if that's something that you normally do or not. But 
Yeah, I think that's logical. All right. Um, I think we're ready to go on to agenda item number seven, which there, there were some things in the packet today. Anybody want to talk about the things that were in the packet? Not seeing any buddy jumping up and down about that. Um, so again, I would like to uh, express gratitude to Alana for her now many years of service. I may also may I might not be back here next month also. Um, but um, I think everyone is thankful for your service, Alana. And Michael just texted me and said to make sure that um, that he's grateful for your years of service also. And he wants me to express that specifically to you. So, but anyone else? It shouldn't just be me. Thank you, Alana. Your time has been tremendous and your expertise and what you've brought, even from what I've learned since I joined the board went on before. Uh, it's been incredible. And I know the time you've taken and dedicated and that you run a business, you have a family. So um, that's an amazing thing you've done. And yeah, I really appreciate it. So we'll miss you for sure. Yeah, Thanks. I want to thank Alana as well, again, for your work over the last three years on our board, your, your work on the predecessor to this, the map, uh, doing all that on top of running a business, having a family, being proactive in all these kinds of policy discussions as they happen everywhere. Um, I'm just grateful for your expertise and your advice through all of this as we all learn a lot about something that is brand new for many people. Thanks, guys. I, I just want to share that I have a lot of mutual gratitude um, and share that same uh, level of honor with working with all of you guys. And, um, you know, I know we're, we're all, we all have a lot going on with families and, and jobs. And so there's a lot of mutual respect and gratitude. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to also just add, um, Alana, you and I have been um, together on this train for, for a good amount of time um, and just wanted to thank you for, you know, being a, a leader, being a mentor, being somebody who's really helped, um, you know, just guide me in this process even too. Um, and I have a lot of respect for for what you've done and, and, and all of the juggling that you've done, whether it's, you know, with time and, and all of the responsibilities as well as um, how things have, have been, um, the story that's been told throughout this process um, surrounding you and surrounding your business. And, and I just really have a lot of respect for you and um, it could not have been easy. Um, and I look forward to whatever you're gonna um, shift into next and um, focusing your time on other other things. So um, just good luck and um, thanks for, for everything that you've done for not only the board, but also for the industry and for, for my, um, kind of my my role in this board as well so thanks Sandra yeah thank you uh, I also want to express my gratitude to Alana um, you you and I have worked together on the marijuana advisory panel and that's when I first met you and I've always appreciated um, just the thoughtfulness in your comments and your um, intelligence in this area and just really appreciated your time, I think, in expertise that you've shared with the panel and, and now here with this group. Um, you know, as someone who has served on um, a volunteer board in my community, I know what it means and it's a sacrifice. And for you to have done it as long as you have is really quite amazing. And so really appreciate um, your time and uh, efforts. So thank you. And I want to personalize it by saying, but I don't want to have people think that everybody can get a tour of your facility, but I learned so much um, coming and doing the tour with you that I'm 
I was so grateful and much more educated. Yeah, Alana, I really um, also just want to add that I think the you've put so much time and energy into this board over the years and um, really taking the lead from the beginning on how this board functions and and serving the, the city of Boulder. Um, so just really appreciate all, all that you've brought, um, your expertise and time. Um, I know whoever that is, she's getting complimented. Give her five more minutes. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, thank you so much, Alana. I really appreciated working with you and excited to um, stay in touch in some way. Yeah. You guys are surprising me and, and it's a, bringing up a little bit of an emotional response, which I didn't expect. Um, this is my last meeting. And um, as I said, it's been, it's been since the beginning of time, since we started the business, we realized early on at the advice of the founder of the farm that you can't just, you know, think you can run a canvas business. You have to be a really dedicated, involved community member. Um, there's just no way to get through this experience without, um, you know, trying to, um, you know, let people know what it's like to be in this, in the side of the community, the business community as well. And I just want to share that it was a really difficult decision not to reapply. Um, there's a lot of aspects of this work that I really enjoy and I find it to be obviously incredibly important and I'm, I'm passionate about representing business owners and cannabis business owners and cannabis employees and, um, can, and responsible adult consumers as well. Um, and, and that work will continue um, definitely. Um, in my role as a founding CEO, I have not held on to many things for very long as long as I have held on to my role in, in Boulder cannabis policy, it's in building a business, I've had to learn things and then um, train other people to do them and empower them to, um, to, to take that work on so that I can move on and kind of continue building and, and growing. And so it's really just in that spirit of passing the torch and empowering others to lead that, that I decided not to reapply. Um, it's no lack of, of desire to be here or, or passion for the work. Um, and yeah, like I said earlier, I, I won't be your board member after this meeting, but I plan to uh, be the constituent of every single board member here and you know be in touch and, and communicate communicative about um, you know there's uh, the latest latest and greatest. Um, so um, my time will be instantly gobbled up by the business and, and the family, but I also have really wanted to have more time to participate in oversight of the schools that my kids go to. So, um, you know, I'll be present in like PTO and accountability committees. Um, and also, you know, in the last 10 years, our, our business has grown outside of Boulder. The, you know, the cultivation size limitation in Boulder forced us um, to, to move a, a big portion of our business to Denver. So I have to kind of broaden my aperture of, of cannabis policy advocacy. So that's, um, you know, a little bit of kind of where my time will go to on the policy advocacy side um, after CLAB, but it's not to say that I, I won't be, you know, listening and paying attention and, and, and participating from a constituent side of things. So it's been a really pleasure to get to know all of you and to work with you. Um, and thanks for, thanks for having me. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to uh, run an efficient meeting that uh, gets out early. Weird, I know, but let's do it. Um, I may or may not be back next month. If I'm here, I'll see you. If not, you can you can roast me after I'm gone. How about that? Um, just so you know, I did look up the rules of procedure mm -hmm. related to um, election and chair and vice chair. It's section two point eight in your rules, and it doesn't specify when that should happen, but it says the club shall appoint from a, amongst its membership, a chair and a vice chair in the absence of both the chair and the vice chair, the chair shall appoint an acting chair. So 
Um, while it doesn't specify the time frame, I think it's maybe Kristen or others can jump in, but I think it's pretty common for that to be addressed um, when new members come on board. So um, you might want to think about whether or not that's something that you want to bring forward next month or not. Well, someone suggested, I can't remember who it was, Allison maybe, uh, it might be wise to do it a little while after new members are here, so. Brian, you're on, you're on mute, so. No, I agree that it's probably worth members getting the acclimated to the culture and priorities of the board before electing new leadership. So yeah, it should probably be done annually or. Okay. Um, my son's coming over, so I'm going to go have dinner with him. All right. So motion to anyone on the motion to adjourn. Brian motion. motions to, I'll let, I'll let Alana do it. Let Alana do it. <laughs> motion to adjourn. All right, second. Brian seconds the last motion. All right. Anyone opposed? All right. Have a good month. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Steph. Thanks. Thanks.